Yes, so here, for instance, there are uh, the, two, uh, the two regulations that were supposed to, uh, to take care of the problem uh, that uh, we, we are speaking about, the European Financial Transparency Gateway. And um, it didn't work, so uh, they, they did regulations and they expected then the, the various national authorities to comply and to dump the, the, common, the data into a common database. Uh, but these national authorities, they, um, they, they combine, they use that data and they, they derive revenue, they get money out of it. And said, whoa, 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 if we give that data for free in your common central database, who's going to get the money? We are going to lose money, we don't want that, right? And um, so uh, the guys, after two years, the, the project had not even started. So they turned to us and they asked, can we, can, we, uh, can we maybe have a, a blockchain solution? It helped that uh, they got, a, they got a, a budget line labeled, earmarked for blockchain. So they said, okay, we have money to do something with blockchain. And they turned to us and asked, can you do something with blockchain? They said, yes, we can do something with blockchain. And we came up with, um, with a system where data, instead of being exchanged or dumped in a central database, it is shared and everybody has access to all data. But if you put together the data brought in by the Germans and the data brought in by the Lithuanians, it's not the same. The Lithuanians are going to get a lot more benefit because the Germans have a lot more data. Whereas the Germans, it won't make any difference with the, the 20 companies that the Lithuanians have in, in, on their stock exchange. So they say, well, 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 we are putting together, but we are contributing a lot more and we are not going to get as much in return. So here is where the cooperative game theory and Shapley value comes into the picture. Oh my God, stream bringing value in a centralized setting. <clears throat> so here in a, in a few, uh, in a few uh, steps, the, the idea behind of the, of the mechanism of allocating value in proportion to how the data is actually used. So you have first uh, the EU who has money and who has the investors and financial analysts who want to invest in Europe to have access to the financial reports of the listed companies like in the US. When you invest in the US, you go to the uh, website of the Securities and Exchange Commission and you have the Edgar database and you can pull out the financial reports of the various uh, companies, listed companies and compare them and therefore make a decision of where to invest the money. In Europe, you don't have that. You have 28 uh, national authorities, and you have to pull the financial reports from the various uh, countries where the companies are listed and then do your comparison by, uh, by, by, by yourself, like on your own, right? <coughs> so the commission said, we, we have money and we want to give this information to the financial analysts for free. Uh, but the problem is this information, this financial information is in the hands of these national authorities, the OIMs. And they don't want to give it for free because they sell it now. So why would they give it for free, right? So enter, enter the Steam blockchain into the picture and uh, some kind of a token called the, the, the Euro-backed EFTG token. And um, so the commission generates, it's, the, it's again like a fiat, uh, like a central bank here, and it generates uh, EBE tokens. And it distributes them to the investors and financial analysts as it sees fit, huh? it's, it, the, our customers, the, the politicians, let's say, are going to create their own governance rules on how to distribute these tokens, right? But they are going to give them away for free. They are going to airdrop them in a sense, right? And then the financial analysts are going to spend them with the various, imagine I've only represented one uh, national authorities, but imagine they, they pick and choose like when you go to a supermarket. I don't want this, this financial reports from Germany and that financial report from France and there are other financial reports from uh, Netherlands and wherever, right? And then if they get the tokens, the guy are going to give away the financial informations, which is what they want, right, to, to the investors. But uh, where's the money, right? So the money is in, uh, I at the commission and the commission says, look, you are going to come to us with your EBE that you've, you've got from, gotten from the financial analyst and we are going to redeem them for real euros. So in this picture, everybody is happy. The commission wanted the financial uh, investors and analysts to get the information for free. They got them for free and the uh, national authorities, they wanted money and they get money. 
So what, what da, does that have to do with, with STEAM, our STEAM, right? First is increases, increases familiarity with, with the system. So with the blockchain in general, what the blockchain can do and what the STEAM blockchain can do in particular, okay? We, are go we, say, we say inside that we are working with the STEAM blockchain. So there, you know, like someone this morning said, uh, oh, I think Smooth is here. I said, no, no, Smooth is not here. But I, I think I, I saw some. Yes, you saw you saw the name smooth on the like you know the the, the name imprinted on uh, uh, because because it appears there. So S S steam will imprint on the on the brains of those two guys that I've shown you earlier, huh? Frederica Mogherini and Jerzy Katainen. Uh, then you'll have increased reputation for performance and versatility, increased demand for utopian services and increased demand for Steam developers and Steam skills, which is going to bring more people into the system because if you can get a job by knowing to code Steam, then you are going to get more interested to learn about Steam, right? And what is missing here is the ease of Steam purchasing. Uh, but I don't have an answer yet to that. So what's the takeaway? Uh, Steam can't moon without the normies. And anything blockchain is hard, so we need to avoid scaring the normies away. And they need to see how the blockchain systems can change their daily lives. And another interesting thing is investing in Steam Power entitles you to pay from the community budget. And this, uh, the idea above, if, if it gets you to the head of normies, they, it can spark a virtuous investment circle. Because as more people compete to have a say on the distribution of this community budget, more people will buy Steam, which will increase the value of Steam in fiat currency, right? And using the Steam code for specific implementation increases reputation of the Steam ecosystem and demand for Steam-related skills. So finally, uh, to, to uh, close this presentation, the mouth and the money. I believe people respond to incentives. So uh, about me, you know I'm not bullshitting you because I'm here under my real name. I am Sorin Crisescu, I'm not an avatar. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, I don't know, whoever. Uh, I've never powered down. I, I powered up uh, everything I, I, I had. I had a choice between uh, buying myself a nice BMW X5 or buying Steam, and I chose the latter. And uh, yeah, for the moment, I'm, I'm uh, down 67%, so yeah, that's life. <laughs> um, so I want to thank you. Here are my, uh, my uh, accounts. I run a witness with, uh, with a very good guy. Uh, it's Luke's witness. So uh, I'd be very happy if you approve our witness. Um, I, uh, run, I run two accounts, one that is more serious, let's say the, the Sorin Crisescu one, and the light one, which is actually not very light because I started uh, publishing my uh, PhD thesis, which I've never defended uh, on it. So uh, it's, uh, it's the, the Sorin light account has a half uh, s silly post and half p uh, post in French about the transcriptional regulation of a retrotransposon of the Drosophila melanogaster fly. Uh, and then I have a, a private project which is in uh, very early stages called uh, Resolid. Um, yeah, doing uh, social stuff with blockchain. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sorin. Thanks a lot. Um, blackout? No? Just a bit tired. Ladies and gentlemen, come again. And uh, no, we are really already ran out of questions. But I think, are you? Is your when's your flight? Monday? Uh, no, uh, um, Sunday. Sunday. We have time for questions. All right. Uh, I want to introduce up uh, the stage uh, Michael and Kirk from um, for, uh, all the way from the U.S. of A. I was there in May. I visited uh, their office, the Sandbox office in Brooklyn. Uh, where they also recently held uh, a steam-powered art or exposition gallery. Yeah. And I think you guys, well, they were last year in Lisbon, obviously. And they're going to update you what they did the past year. Um, so without further ado, uh, Michael and Kirk, 
It's up to you. Hello, hello. Check. Well, thank you guys for coming. Uh, we are Sandbox. We've been around for about a year and a half officially. Kirk and I have been on this new blockchain since the fall of 2016. And after, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Steam Park, we decided to officially start an office that we're full time on after business called Sandbox. And so the title of the speech and presentation is Stories, Creativity, and Puzzles, hashtag Biddling Steam as the Leader of Crypto Culture. And we're going to show a bit of what, we're, what we've been creating over the last year since our last presentation at Steamfest 2.0 and what we've been up to and what we're trying to do and how everyone here can get involved on and off Steam. So we're going to start with our video that we created uh, with a design company last spring. If it's going to continue. Ooh, there we go. Connection. Yeah. Is that okay? This is the... Living in a world where our ideas come first and money comes later, if at all. We're gonna, we're gonna try it again we're in just a second. Oh yeah, which... Uh, uh, so just while we're waiting, the, the video was developed by a design firm, um, animation firm out of the Twin Cities in the US called Humdinger and Sons. And the way we found them was they did the video for the Bat Token and Brave. The Brave and we, Browser, yeah. The Brave, the Brave Browser. browser. Um, and if you've seen that, it's one of the most incredible explanations of why cryptocurrency and blockchain are impactful on different specific industries. We reached out to them, we struck up a deal, and we created this video. Uh, I think we finished it by May, uh, and we released it. It's Apple. It's Apple, you know? Apple. We're designers, sorry, we have an Apple computer, so that's, <laughs> that's our bad. We can, we can talk through it, too, if we, uh, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we have a couple other videos, but we'll okay. skip those videos for now. Okay. Okay, whatever works. We could, we could talk, we're happy to just keep talking, too, if you like talking. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the video is, it's, um, we were really compelled when we saw the Brave video, because it was one of the few videos that really, visualized the blockchain in a way that was super elegant, was really compelling, was very artful and creative. And for us, we, we wanted Steam to have that same sort of identity because it is a creative community, it's a content community. And so we're constantly working with these guys to come up with new ways of visualizing the blockchain, making it more accessible through imagery. We're designers ourselves, so that's, that's kind of our outlet or window into this world. And we think there's a ton of potential to kind of uh, make this stuff real and build physically, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. I mean, the reason we, we started on Steam and discovered Steam first in the blockchain sector was we had a hypothesis that this technology would allow us to revolutionize the way creatives produce in the world. Architects, artists, musicians, actors, actresses, everybody who creates content for a living. And we experimented with it. We did Steam Park. We created this video precisely because it's very difficult to rustle up a very traditional industry like creativity, uh, especially when you're talking with terms that people haven't heard before. So in order to explain what we do and get more people to work with us, whether it's institutions or other companies, we wanted to create a very short, concise video that was compelling, uh, that didn't look like an ICO site, and was uh, a way to kind of hook people into the space and so we can start this conversation. This is really what the video was designed to do, uh, and hopefully you guys get that feeling as well. Uh, but yeah, I think you guys remember, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and last year we presented our project Steam Park, and this kind of leads into that as well. But let's see if this is. Uh, we might be finding. Thanks for your patience, guys. Find it. Okay. Okay. I guess I'll talk about Sandbox more as we gear up for this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. oh, is it working? Okay. Living in a world where our ideas come first and money comes later, if at all is frustrating. And whether you're an artist, an architect, or a nonprofit, being at the mercy of third parties to find success can make you feel, well, you know. With Sandbox, we invite you to a community that frees you from the grasp of social platform behemoths that rely on you to help make their profits, thanks to the power of blockchain. 
Now, behind the facade of cryptocurrency, blockchain technology helps us to create a rich ecosystem of creativity, collaboration, and innovation. We help integrate your creative process with emerging tools of the crypto world, helping you to quickly navigate through the hype and hysteria to discover real resources with real results. So join us to start actualizing your ambitions and learn more about a decentralized future powered by your creativity. Sandbox. Creativity empowered. Alrighty. Um, so Sandbox is just that. We're a creative studio out of Brooklyn, and we also are a community. And a lot of the work we do is about kind of education, empowerment, and utility, using the blockchain for real world applications. And for us as creatives, this seemed like a no-brainer within the Steam community that you could leverage the content that you create to actually have a second and a third life outside of that content and make something real out of it. Um, and the next slide talks about uh, Steam Park, which is, was our first sort of proof of concept of that application. Can you, you know, take something like a blog post and break it up to share the story of a neighborhood, use the content shared on that blog post to create signage and ultimately fund a park project? Uh, so this is what we did in Brooklyn uh, about a year and a half ago, and that has had a tremendous effect, not only in the community in Brooklyn, which is like super blockchain right now, but uh, it, it's an example of something physical that takes something very invisible and helps people understand it, grasp it, interact with it in a way that's a lot more humanized and uh, impressionable um, and empowering for a real place. Um, and so this, uh, within the Steam Park stuff, this has been, uh, an ongoing project for us actually where people keep coming back to it. They literally go to the park and then they email us and this was actually a recent interview with uh, Brick TV which is a local station in Brooklyn and they did a huge profile at this. They went to the Ethereal Summit. We met them there and then they were like, you guys built this park thing. We got to learn more about that. So uh, we were super excited to meet with Brick TV and they did a really good profile of Steam and talked about a handful of other projects that are using the blockchain for social good. Uh, so this was Brian Vines, who does this series where he walks around Brooklyn, learns more about the things that are happening on the ground, and uh, blockchain was this episode where he was like, what the heck is this? How do we describe this to normal people? And is it real? What's, does it bake bread was his big theme in this episode. Uh, and said, we said it bakes benches <laughs> and bread, lots of things. Um, and uh, this past summer, uh, you know, the next step of this was you know, looking at ways that we can start to visualize better what's happening within the STEAM community. So this past summer, we had the Crypto Renaissance Exhibition in Brooklyn, which a lot of you guys helped make happen through your upvotes, through amazing support, through Fundition, STEAM Press, Utopian. Uh, you guys made this show happen, and this was uh, a profile from BTC Manager who did this. We are surprised we didn't know that they were doing that uh, render of it. Um, but the whole thing was uh, this show in Brooklyn that was supposed to help people enter the Steam blockchain, learn more about it through profiles of the projects that people were doing within the incubator. So we showed all these different projects that were happening. We did tons of workshops throughout the whole month that it was open. It was open for about six weeks and it was totally free. So people could come in off the street and learn more about this. And we think there need to be more accessible entry points for that within the blockchain ecosystem. Um, and we created a fun, DAP tower right in the middle that had a, an iPad connected to Steep Shot, so we had a selfie station so people could, instead of a guest book for the show, they could take a selfie, it would be published on the blockchain, and then we would say, you know, that's helping pay for the show itself. Uh, so instead of, you know, the typical fees for entering an exhibition, you could just take a selfie, use content as your ticket in. Uh, so this was a lot of fun. This was a way for us to kind of uh, interact with a lot of folks who are completely new to the Steam blockchain, completely new to the blockchain in general, and learn more about why Steam is an empowering resource for content creators. And this is in the heart of Brooklyn where you have every cafe full of creators. So they're hungry for this, they just don't know what's out there. So our hope is that by doing more of these things and exhibiting the real projects that, like those happening within the Sandbox community, this is a really compelling sort of argument that uh, relates to people who don't need to know the technology to use the product. And we, we I just want to emphasize that we had probably over a thousand people come in and out for the workshops and the opening, and almost none of them were Steamians. 
and the vast majority of them had never really interacted with Bitcoin or blockchain. So we purposefully put this out with local media and different partners uh, so that people who are interested, crypto curious, which in New York is probably 99% of everyone in the city, would feel welcome. They don't have to go to you know, a consensus conference that costs $800, but they can just come off the street anytime they like. Uh, we would be there, or some of our friends would be there. Uh, Doug Carr was part of the workshop. Ophelia Fu was there to do a presentation as well for our exhibition. Uh, so it was, for us, one of the, a, a really productive way to talk to people in this situation where they don't feel like they're being talked at, they can engage, they can take it at their own pace. And so because of our experience doing exhibitions in the past, we thought this would be a, a unique medium to try out explaining and engaging people with this technology. And it's these type of uh, uh, real world sort of experiences that we like to take advantage of. We're, we're designers, we like to build physical things, and we like to have these workshops that are a mix of educational, creative, you know, draw things on the blockchain, upload it. We did work with uh, the Department of Transportation in New York. We met with the World Bank last year and did a presentation about resiliency in blockchain. We're at Columbia University for a lecture to the design school there. Uh, we've been uh, in a lot of different schools throughout New York and we're trying to really impress upon the young academic public that this is something that they need to research and look into more seriously, which relates to a lot of presentations we've heard today. This is a really empowering resource for young people to learn more about now, get their hands on, and that becomes the new generation of talent uh, that enters this ecosystem. And it's, it's not just you know Mike and I running around on the ground in New York City, this is a community of people that are liaison through these amazing stewards, many of whom are in the crowd right now. And they have their own communities and we're using our steam power to help make sure that that work around the world gets support and gets more visibility. And so we want Sandbox to be this billboard that other communities can use and leverage to empower the work that they're doing and the communities that they're building. Um, and I think we did a emoji poll in our Slack and I think we had 23 countries within Sandbox last time we did it and we are looking to open that up now. Uh, prior to now, we've had kind of a closed cohort model trying to experiment with what we want Sandbox to be. Uh, beginning in December 1st, we're actually opening that all up. So we're gonna have a Discord and we're gonna have uh, more emphasis on curating weekly challenges. I think some of you guys have seen our Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday challenges. They're usually about education in the blockchain world. We had a, a bunch of different post uh, ideas and we worked with Utopian on one for imagine your own SMT. And we, those are open calls that anyone can participate in. And through kind of exploring what the blockchain can offer, we curate that and that's something that we're gonna make more open uh, beginning December 1st, so we're excited about that. Uh, so I'm gonna hop in right now yeah, and please. talk about a project that kind of formulated by accident over the last year, but has become uh, a major force that we've been pushing and that's the Creative Crypto. I don't know if you guys have seen the magazine online, thecreativecrypto.com. We have at Creative Crypto on Steemit. On Twitter, it's at Creative underscore Crypto. Uh, but basically, as we were doing the programming with Sandbox, a couple months, about six, eight months in, we started to talk to a lot of companies in New York City, a lot of creative-based ones, because that's our forte. And we realized that there wasn't a forum for a lot of these discussions. We would have, let's say, a uh, conversation with the CryptoKitties team. And they, they would talk about a lot of their you know, missions and, and hopes and ideas for projects. But of course, Cointelegraph or Coindesk is only gonna focus on their six-figure CryptoKitty. So we thought, this is a shame. There's a lot of ideas in the background. And we, again, had a hypothesis that the ideas would attract people. Not the money, not the finances, not the tech. That's a small subset of the global population. The real sexy stuff, the things that people really wanna be involved in, uh, is the culture around a particular new technology, which is obviously still growing today. Uh, this is a, an example landing page of the website right now. We do interviews, we do spotlights, we do thought pieces, opinion pieces. Uh, we do media partnerships with different conferences and events. These are the stats just for the last six months. We started the kind of alpha back in April and then we launched a new website in July. And since then it's become the main thing that across blockchains people look to for information or insight into the creative aspects, fashion, design, architecture, art, music. And we're constantly working with these different uh, companies. And we have 10K unique viewers a month. Uh, last month alone, it was read by people in 83 countries. So we're really excited by this. We thought we started this as kind of a side project, but it's ballooned into a legitimate magazine. And we've been trying to keep up 
with making sure that it's a legitimate place for not only people in the blockchain space, but more importantly, again, if you have heard of blockchain from your cousin or whatever, or you're a creative professional, or you like creative things, we want the magazine to be a place that's very welcoming, uh, not you know going over your head all the time, and doesn't make you feel dumb because you don't know all these little jargon terms. Um, and one thing we'd love to emphasize is that the magazine itself is decentralized. Uh, it's built on WordPress. That's built on Steam Press. Everything published there goes to Steam. All of the illustrations are done by a group of illustrators on Steam that we found through Steam. Content is contributed through Steam, translated through Steam, uh, and we're constantly looking for more contributors and more people to help build up this magazine with content, with art. These are our two main head artists, Zolt Bidak and Kara Cake. Kara Cake's a Korean-born artist uh, living out of LA. Zolt is a accomplished illustrator out of Budapest. Uh, and these are just examples of some of the cover images we do when we cover stories about CryptoKitties or talk to artists like Portal Crypto. And one of the things we've been trying to do is bring everybody onto Steam. We think at a baseline, at least Steamit.com is a forum for all the other blockchain companies in the world, all the other practitioners. And our hypothesis, again, is that we want to create a community here, regardless if they're Steam holders or not, that they could use this community and leverage it for their own work, use it as inspiration for their own work. Uh, and this is Zolt again. He just, we, right before we landed in, in uh, Krakow, he sent us a message saying he won a national award called the Gold Lion in Hungary. Uh, and all of this is illustrations he created with the magazine. So in combination with Sandbox as this incubating community that's open for everybody, and the Creative Crypto as a platform, we are hoping that we can help anybody, whether you're a videographer or creator or fashion designer, kind of get to this point. That you can use Steam not as just a way to monetize daily content, but then go to the next level with that content. You can boost your careers, you can do amazing projects. And on the website you'll see partners and people that we work with. We only cover stories on dApps and platforms that are usable today. No speculation, no ICOs, no future nonsense. And you could probably recognize a lot of the partners on here that we work with very closely. Utopian, Steamit.com, of course, Steve Shot, uh, Zapple, Fundition, Steam Hunt, uh, and Steam Monsters is up there. And it also includes lots of dApps and platforms that aren't on the Steam blockchain. And we've actually helped a lot of companies like Dada NYC, Decentraland, Creative Chain, uh, Known Origin, Axie Infinity, CryptoKitties just registered. We want them to have a stake in the Steam blockchain as well, even though they might be Ethereum-based or Neo-based or whatever it might be, because the more people we can bring together, the more ideas we can exchange, and the more opportunities Steamians will have to create art with Steam, publish it on Known Origin, sell it through Dada, whatever that might be. Uh, we're starting to see, because the magazine takes on a very hawk-eye approach to the whole industry, we're able to piece together different partners so we can maximize the creative output of Steamians in the entire blockchain ecosystem. And so we have now, uh, Shortcut is here somewhere. Uh, he, he publishes art on Steam, does art on Dada, and it's, it creates these incredible communities between them. And they love being on Steam because then they can reach what is today the biggest crypto-fluent community in the world, right? I think the Steam community is that. And uh, our latest media partnership, we've been partnering with uh, different organizations. This one was working alongside Coindesk for the new Art Academy in New York City. They're based out of NYU. This is called uh, NYC Art Tech and Blockchain Connect. They did one in Art Basel last year. Uh, that's me moderating. I was invited to moderate a panel with Judy Mom of Dada, Jessica Angel of the Doge Ethereum Bridge, uh, Zach Yanger of Super Rare, the Marketplace, Matt Hall of CryptoPunks, and Kevin Abosh of the uh, Priceless Rose. So you guys might recognize some of those. I think these are some of the biggest titans in terms of creativity in the blockchain. But it's super exciting because now we're able to pull steam into these conversations that it's uh, people, at least in New York, have preconceptions of what steam is and that you have to be a steamian to be part of steam. And I think we're trying to break those down a bit at these conferences. And we have hopes that these conversations will make steam a legitimate tool for creatives. Uh, and this last bit we're going to leave you. So we talked about Sandbox, the creative crypto, um, and we're preoccupied all the time with creating more precedents like Steam Park to prove to creative professionals, you don't have to understand how blockchain works in terms of distributed ledgers and immutable blockchains. What you should care about is that you can create something you want with the help of the tools on the blockchain, just like how we create Steam Park. 
And one of the projects that we're working on now is focused on using and integrating Steam into public projects that anybody can be involved in, whether or not you have a Steam account or Steam uh, ID or whatever it might be. Um, and just we want to leave you with that last bit of wicked. We're going to. I'll, I'll, I'll go in. Here we are. We're, we're <laughs> going to get it. Uh, one more click. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so we have some uh, really fun projects coming up. We're going to announce this next week, but uh, we're going to be doing a series of crypto puzzles that start to, you know, we did the kind of initial example of Steam Park where you can build fund, raise money and essentially build furniture, but that's not with blockchain. That's just slapsticking blockchain on it. So I think there are much more gamified ways that we could be engaging the Steam blockchain and treating the wallets actually as games in and of themselves. So we're super excited about this project that we're going to announce in the next couple weeks, uh, Crypto Puzzles. And uh, this is going to start to play with those things in real life and uh, build stuff with it. Yeah, I don't know if you guys are familiar. There were a couple examples of this. Uh, in 2014, an artist painted a key into a painting, a big spot PC or something. And then the market was high. People reported it saying, you know, $50,000 is locked away in this painting. And then just last month, a Bitcoin miner put in, I think, something like 31 BTC uh, into this weird image. It's a Bitcoin it puzzle. Three million dollars uh, worth of Bitcoin. Three million dollars worth of, uh, I'm, I'm getting a number of something BTC like wrong, calculated right now, but three million dollar USD in this bear market's worth uh, of, of Bitcoin in that painting, and it was our most viewed article on the creative crypto. So we thought, this is something that everybody is interested in because you don't have to know what keys are or wallets are you know that Bitcoin equals money, and we can create fun ways of playing with that technology so that my mother could play this game, uh, could follow along. And so we're going to be creating a series of non-fungible tokens that release bits of clues uh, into different Steam wallets. So we're going to be working with a lot of different companies, a lot of different platforms. And you can see on here, we're going to be creating accounts like Crypto Puzzles. Uh, we have one called uh, Satoshi Secret. Secrets of Satoshi. Secrets of Satoshi. Uh, and we're, we're working with different blockchain companies to produce unique types of puzzles that will all lead to unique Steam accounts. Because what's really cool about Steam is you can name an account, which you can't really do on many other, you can't do it on MetaMask, you can't do it on other types of wallets. So we can take that little kernel and then make something really fun that, again, anybody could collect these images, even if you've never downloaded the Coinbase wallet, and be involved. So we're always thinking about these strategies for people to engage the technology in a fun way, uh, in an engaging way, and that will hopefully draw them in. This is our methodology as designers, uh, and we're hoping it works. We'll see what happens yeah. in a couple. We of don't minutes. have three million Bitcoin. Yeah, we don't have that much. We don't have that much steam. <laughs> we can we can <laughs> you know garner up a hundred steam to put in a wallet, make it fun, and we're going to try out different ways of doing this. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's us looking forward, and thanks for joining us today, guys. Unlikely that we have time for questions. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. We'll be around, and yeah. please feel free to come up to us and talk to us. Yes, so I was approached by Chicken Calm uh, because, yeah, well, he asked if there was still some uh, time available to do a little talk. So I was wondering if he could do a talk instead of you being doing questions. Yeah, of course. Okay, Absolutely. great. Yeah. Ah, you get lucky. Of course. Thanks, guys. I hope yeah. it's nothing obscene or something, right? Yeah. Because uh, I do content curation and filtering, so. Yeah. Okay, have a ball, man. Hey, what's up, everybody? I want to thank Roland for giving me this opportunity. I mean, he could have easily just been like, get out of my face, dude. <laughs> but he was like, no, sure, dude, why not? So um, I'm here to talk to you about um, my project that I'm starting. And I, like, I would like for it to evolve into something more than my project. Like, I would like to let the reins go and let it be its own thing. The title of the project is called The State of Anarchy. So to put this in perspective, the name that I came up for this presentation that I just got awarded is called Exodus. And why I entitled it that, because I believe that Exodus is sort of like more than just a physical relocation. And that is what is needed for people to start really understanding why they have to switch over to cryptos and Steam and all this stuff. So what I mean by that is, yeah, sure, you can migrate to another country or another, you know, crypto-friendly haven like Costa Rica or something. But what really needs to happen on a mass scale for the normies is a mental exodus. People, when you tell them things about like, you know, smart media tokens and non-fungible tokens and you start using a bunch of big words, people like my mother just lose, their, their eyes just glaze over. Do you know what I mean? They don't understand why, I, why they should even care about these really big words. 
And it, to us, it makes no sense because we have this context where we understand the importance of this stuff. But in order to get the masses over, we have to teach them first the reason for Exodus. So when you say things like there's crypto, there's money, there's incentives, you get paid to post what you like to do. Some people do that already on Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff, and they're really happy on those platforms. But what they don't understand is that at any moment, those platforms could turn against them. And not many of those people understand that. In fact, I would venture to say that none of them do. Um, I spoke to a gentleman earlier who had a PayPal account, which isn't even a social media platform. He was a PayPal partner for 17 years, and then one day PayPal just shut him off. He had like a, I think a $20,000 line of credit. He owed 10000 and PayPal was like, yep, we're terminating your account, and it also says in our terms and conditions that we don't have to tell you why. So this dude had to literally sell his house, relocate, and do a bunch of stuff to salvage himself solely because PayPal reserved the right to essentially screw him over at any point in time. And that is what I mean by mental exodus. No one in the normie world understands this. They think Facebook works well for them. They think Instagram, you know, it's cool. It works well for them. But in order to really understand, so they're not going to switch to platforms like Steam and if they're happy and, you know, happily married to mainstream apps. So what I venture to do with the State of Anarchy is to teach people the, the stuff that they don't get told about the control systems in these, like, technocrat apps that are really set up to honestly program them like it's literal mind control like if you look at facebook's new algorithms they're not showing you your favorite facebook pages that you like they're not showing you anything but your immediate friend circle and basically they want to keep you in the same digital pond as you are in the physical pond and that is terrifying and nobody understands it i mean they're just they're seeing their cousins posting you know Donald Trump MAGA hat stuff, you know what I mean? They're, they're just all hurrah, hurrah. And nobody understands that, like, this is all part of how the technocrats are controlling both our minds and our actions through limiting us financially and with laws and stuff. So what the state of anarchy is, is this initiative to explain to people the concept of anarchy and clear up all of the, all of the crap that gets, like, lumped into that. So who here has the idea of anarchy as, like, guys that look like me with mohawks and Molotov cocktails, like, breaking a bunch of glass and, you know, <laughs> it's like covering the city in blood. Anybody? Yeah, okay. Few people. So, I mean, I, there were guys like that in like the 90s or whatever, and you know, whatever, that's their thing. But what it actually means from an etymological perspective, the word an comes from the Greek, which means without or having nothing to do with, and archon meaning rulers. So all it actually means is no rulers, which, I mean, to me sounds pretty reasonable. But if you look it up in the dictionary, that's not what it says. It says chaos. Which, you know, and then that, if you say something like, hi, I'm an anarchist, they're like, oh, so you're, a you're an agent of chaos. Get away from me. <laughs> you know what I mean? So this is all part of the mental exodus that we're trying to instill, which is why we titled it Anarchy. Because we want to be upfront with people. We want to show people that, like, hey, look, we're going to be blunt and direct with you guys because, frankly, we don't have that much time left. You guys have to, people have to start waking up to what's really happening to them in order for them to understand why all this crypto stuff matters. People have debit cards, they have PayPal. They're like, what, everything's fine, what are you talking about? But if you tell them things like bank accounts are freezing people for spending in crypto, like me personally, I took out a credit card to start investing in crypto like a year ago. And I was using the credit card, you know, buying, buying the dips, selling high, and it was really like, it was working out for me. I mean, I was, it was a very easy, I didn't have to invest any capital and I was making money. And then one day Bank of America just emailed me and were like, yeah, you can't do that anymore. And I was like, what? And they literally didn't have an explanation. And that was the end of that. And I, I had to go back to finding other ways to invest in crypto. So naturally, I maxed out that credit card and, you know, told them to go, you know, suck it. <laughs> I'm not paying that at all. I see that as a breach of contract. But what we're trying to do with the state of anarchy is not just in the financial realm, but in the realm of government, in the realm of media. Because what a lot of people don't realize is, like, yeah, we go to government schools and get this government programming and stuff. But the programming continues on when you turn on your television. My dad always makes this joke like, commercials don't work. I never buy any of this stuff. And little does he know, the commercial is doing exactly what its, what its desired outcome is. It's creating this like mental, you see all these people, they're happy, they're going to the store, they're buying like toothpaste with fluoride in it or like, you know, some like ridiculously processed food. And basically the, the commercials and the TV and the sports and the rah, 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 it's all meant to perpetuate this mental sort of like zeitgeist or ethos that like, at least in America, is like the status quo. So what we're trying to do through STEAM is basically create a community of like-minded individuals who understand all this stuff, who understand the control mechanisms, who understand the manipulation, who understand the, um, the subtle ways that we are being moved mentally and physically into areas where 
we are more easily to be controlled. And Steemit is the perfect platform for that. And <laughs> it's kind of a funny story about how I figured that all out. I was, I was trying to do everything on every platform because the way I see it, part of the exodus was taking people from Facebook and Instagram and pulling them to Steemit through links and, you know, stuff like that. But turns out they're really good at censoring that too. Uh, we posted a uh, video on um, police brutality in Philadelphia. There were like these uh, protests for um, the ICE camps or whatever, and the Philadelphia police force, which looked like a standing army, it was horrifying. If you watch the video, they literally just swarmed in and destroyed these camps. It was crazy. So when I went to post that on Facebook, it got no engagement because Facebook makes you pay to get engagement. So I go to pay to boost the post, and I get hit with this warning that's like, you are not authorized <laughs> to post or to advertise on issues relating to politics or national importance. And I'm like, well, that's crazy. There's like an AI out there that <laughs> filters what people are paying to promote and basically tells them that they can't. So there's like a verification process and I was a little desperate so I checked into it and scared me even more. I had to give up my name, my social security number. You had to give up your address and they were gonna mail you like a letter with like a QR code on it or something to prove that you live there. Which to me is just like, I mean, that's database, do you know what I mean? You're, you're in a database of some guy who likes to, you know, talk about national issues, and if anything ever hits the fan in America, which, you know, could be before the end of this decade, you're on, you're on the list. So, needless to say, that was my end with Facebook as far as promoting this project, and I devoted all of the energy to Steam because I see Steam as the exact antithesis of that. Steam is completely censorship resistant, which was the most enticing thing for me. The fact that I could say whatever I want about Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or whoever it were, and that no one, none of their maniacal AI forces could stop Steam it from encoding it in the blockchain for eternity. It's written in stone. Code is law. And that was really enticing to me. And then when I started understanding about how upvotes work and how delegations can happen and how you can actually help people who are new to the platform and give them like a kickstart and you know get them going, I was like, dude, this could be it. This could be how we could like take all these black flag anarchists, rip them out of their mother's basements, finance them, and get these messages out so that we can create that mental exodus. And once we do that to the normies, then they're like, oh, I get it now. I don't, I'm not going to be censored. I'm going to be empowered instead of like tracked and like logged into some like marketing database. And I'm going to be able to actually, you know, benefit from this, not just myself, but my family and my communities. So essentially what the state of anarchy is, right now it's one account, but it's sort of like an aggregate account. We do a lot of re-steams. We re-steam all sorts of like anarcho-spiritualist people. Like, I'm not sure if any of you guys are familiar with the conference in Arcapoco. Anybody here? Nice, couple hands. I know Luke was in here earlier. He was there last year. Um, Jeff Berwick's one of the guys that we re-steam a lot. We, we find ourselves agreeing with him on almost everything he posts. And the idea is through re-steaming, through coordinated like efforts, and through coordinated upvoting, we can like tell these anarchists, hey look, we can get you a platform where not only can you promote this message and spread it and wake people up to the control systems that they're being subjugated to, but you can empower yourself financially so that you're not a victim of them as well. Because let's face it, that's how they control us, through central banking. That's how they control everything. It's centralized monetary funds. I mean, <laughs> Roland was making a satire of it last night. Who was at the bowling event last night? Yeah, Roland was like, <laughs> the drink tickets. He was like, we have drink tickets and we can print them at our leisure and they're infinite. And I mean, that's what they do. They're just like, we have these dollars and they got a bunch of dead presidents on them and we could just print them over and over again and just, you know, pay people to do whatever we want them to do. And I, we here at the State of Anarchy, we don't, we don't like that mentality. We like the mentality of, you know, fairness, like integrity, and support for you know real communities and real like just real shit. Sorry for cursing, but um, so yeah, basically that's what we're doing here. Um, we all have personal accounts and stuff, and I, I do like artistic stuff on my personal account. But my passion is definitely the state of anarchy. I want to see a lot of people wake up to not just how they're being controlled, but the things that are being hidden from them. I find that that's even more important. How many in this room would consider themselves somewhat spiritual, not religious, spiritual? Good. Got a couple, a couple spirit nerds here, my spirit fam. Like to see that. So yeah, I mean, but if you poll people in like places like the United States or like very like sort of logical places, I mean, the narrative that is pushed is atheism. I mean, atheism is the religion of the control system. You know, and I was an atheist for like 10 years. My mom used to cry every night, you don't worship Jesus, you're gonna burn in hell forever. I'm like, mom, it's fine, it's not real, none of it's real. But then I realized that like all of those religious stories point back to a deeper spiritual truth. And I found that when I aligned myself to that truth, that magic would happen. It was almost like you, you reach this sort of like coherence with the vibrations of the universe and that coherence resonates and pulls in powerful energies and powerful events. I mean, even this conference, 
is one of those things, in my opinion. I was pulled here just as magically as anyone else. I met my film guy, Pat, over there at Anarchapoco. We literally, <laughs> we had that stupid Osmo thing. We were walking around, and we both had it. We were, like, filming each other. And then it turned out that we had a lot of similar interests. We both have tattoos about DMT on our arms, which is pretty clutch. And then, <laughs> and then um, lo and behold, he hit me up, like, a couple months later and was like, dude, I like the state of anarchy. I want to get involved with what you're doing. He lived in upstate New York. I lived in Philadelphia. I was like, dude, I got a spare room. Come live in my house. <laughs> Move in with me. He was like, do you have cats? I'm like, yeah. He was like, oh. <laughs> I'm allergic. I'm like, you can do it, man. So he put up my cat and all its dander and all of its, you know, hijinks. He's peeing on everything because this meant something to him. You know, it was, it was real. It was like doing something that, like, isn't just doing it for the sake of money or doing it just for the sake of something to do. I mean, how many people here have gotten into that cycle of, like, just constantly occupying yourself because what would you do if you just sat there for, like, 15 minutes? You know, all those feelings start creeping up and stuff like that. And, like, a lot of people don't know how to just be. And that, I think, is the ultimate thing that the control system hides from us. So this is all sorts of things that I would love to start, you know, getting more on, like, people's awareness as far as when it comes to crypto. Because a lot of people have that money awareness. And money is important. Money is just energy. Current C. Current. A current of energy. And that's, that's what's nice is because when you have rivers flowing freely, they're beautiful. But when you have, like... I liken, like, the central banking system to, like, the Philadelphia Water Department. It's, like, this grotesque, industrialized pond of fluoridated water, and it's just a cesspool, essentially. So what we aim to do is empower any and all anarchists, or even if you're not an anarchist, just people who have woken up a little bit to how they're being manipulated, whether it's mentally, spiritually, or physically, and to give those people power, energy, currency to promote that message further and create a virtuous cycle of just, you know, those people start helping other people, the upvotes start curating up and up, and then if the majority of Steemians were like a bunch of like woke meditators who were like levitating on tops of mountains and stuff, that'd be pretty sweet, you know what I mean? I mean, that's the dream for me at least. So yeah, I mean, if anybody's curious, if anybody has like similar pages, that it doesn't even have to be about anarchy, it just could be about any type of truth that empowered you. That's what I believe it all is at the end of the day. Truth is knowledge, knowledge is power. So if you understand the truth and you can communicate it to any degree, we will support you 100%, and we would love to team up with you. So, yeah, that's pretty much all I got. Thanks for listening, guys. I really appreciate everything. I'll see you around. Thank you. You can come. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks, Roland. Okay. We're going to set up Mr. Andrew and then continue the program. Okay, guys. I made a mistake, actually. I also, I'm also just human, right? We're human after all. It's a quote by Daft Punk. Anyone knows it? Daft Punk. Yes, oh yeah, Daft Punk. Daft Punk. Okay, I made a mistake in the schedule. It says dinner and drinks in Stara Zayeznia, but obviously that's copy pasting errors, you know? Because yesterday was dinners and drinks in Stara Zayeznia. Today we do dinner and drinks in here. Okay? Just so you know. Um, yeah. Are you having a good time? Are you still alive? Okay, we're gonna do uh, the hand thingy. Uh, who slept eight hours yesterday, this night? He wow 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 wow. Okay, who slept seven hours? One. Who slept six hours? Okay. Who slept five hours? Oh, I, I slept five hours. Who slept four hours? Okay. Who slept three hours? Two hours? One hour? Who didn't sleep? Everybody slept. Okay, three hours is the winner. Congratulations. You've won a night of sleep after this weekend. Okay, so uh, remember half a year ago, or three quarters of a year ago, Bitcoin was all in the news. Google banning Bitcoin ads, ICO ads, Facebook banning Bitcoin ads, ICO ads. Now slowly there are the, 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 the philosophy or the, the vision is changing a bit, but still Andrew is going to tell more about it. Um, 
and what he's going to do, right, about this. That's right. I, I'm going to talk more broadly about life after Google, about decentralization um, and the economic theories, the economic basis behind everything we're doing. We've, we've seen... We've seen at this conference amazing apps, amazing open source projects, um, crypto changing the world. But where does it actually fit in with everything else? So I'm talking about life after Google. I'm talking about Ronald Coase and Coase's Penguin being Linux and open source. How does this all fit together? Okay, Life After Google is a Life After Google is a very recently published book by George Gilder. Now, G George Gilder is one of the rolled gold uh, economists and futurists of the world. He was Ronald Reagan's favorite author, hugely influential in the Reagan administration. He wrote a book 25 years ago called Life After Television, where he predicted everything we have today. The iPhones, you know, Google Maps, uh, messaging, everything that we have today, he predicted that, and he was right about that. And he's come up with a new book called Life After Google, which is predicting that blockchain-based decentralization is going to take over from the current Google-centric model of the world. And he calls it the cryptocosm. So I'm going to adopt that term, the cryptocosm, because in my speeches and things, I just say the crypto industry, the crypto community, how do we describe ourselves? So from now on, I'm going to talk about the cryptocosm. It's everyone in crypto. It's the uni new universe that's being created by Steam, by everyone in the crypto space that's creating a new decentralized world. We're going to look at where that world can take us. So, in the cryptocosm, security is not a procedure or a mechanism. It's not an add-on. It's a fundamental part of the architecture. It's the private keys. It's what underlies who we are, the fundamental identifier of ourselves in this new space. It's a decentralized, bottom-up architecture, not the centralized thing where Facebook and Google control our entire lives and harvest all our data and... Um, monetize us, power and financial rewards reside with users, not with the centralized trusted party. Users regain control of their content, security and privacy. Now, most people here know this. This is what they're here for because we are Steamians. We're in crypto. But what most people aren't thinking about is the broader picture. We have collective self-governance. Steam votes, upvotes and downvotes. Steam, Steam it is a far more civilized place for discussion, even on controversial topics, than any other platform I've been on. Centralized platforms like Google and Facebook deliberately provoke people into trolling each other and behaving badly to each other because it gets people on the platform. I gave up Facebook two years ago when I realized it was provoking me. The algorithm was provoking me to, you know, with, with opinions that I would disagree with in order to get me to engage with the platform. That's what it does. We say people behave badly on Facebook and Google, on the current platforms. It's because the platforms encourage bad behavior. But Steam encourages good behavior. It's the cryptocosm. And also, no authoritarian censorship. You know, uh, AgroEd spoke on, at the start of this uh, yesterday about the censorship on Facebook and Google. No censorship. Self-governance, but no absolute censorship, no authoritarian censorship. Okay, so here we are. This is an infographic showing the multitude of Web 3.0, of crypto projects that are competing with all the existing Web 2.0 projects. It's very important to understand that in every area, retail and entertainment, personal ticketing, content monetization, uh, Internet of Things, web search, every single area of the whole Internet, there are crypto players who are coming up with better solutions and competing with the old models, and particularly competing with Google and Facebook, who, of course, control much of the existing Internet. 
So what is the cryptocosm? What, what, is, what are we doing? We know what we're doing in, in detail, creating new apps, blogging, putting videos up, all these sorts of things. But, but where does this fit into economic theory, into the understanding of human organisation? In 1937, Ronald Coase um, wrote... A book called the Nat a paper called the Nature of the Firm, for which he won a Nobel Prize in economics, and what he s said is that there are two forms of human economic or organization. There's the firm, you know, companies, people working for companies, um, and there's the free market. And he asked the question, you know, the free market is, you know, what works in general amongst firms. Why don't we have a free market within firms? Why isn't everyone a free agent? Firms themselves are hierarchical centralised structures. Why do we have that? And he also asked the question in the reverse because he was in the era of communism. He said, well, why don't we have a completely centralised economy like the Soviet Union was? Why can't you do that? And the answers were that each model, the free market and the firm, have different advantages and disadvantages, different costs. And so a firm will expand to a certain size when it becomes inefficient for it to expand and another firm will take the place. And there's competition between those firms and a free market. So he said there were two forms of economic organisations. And he won a Nobel Prize for this. It's really fundamental. But now we have something new that's neither the firm, a centralised firm, or a free market. Jochai Benkler wrote in 2001 a paper called Coase's Penguin, um, about open source peer production, the Penguin, of course, being Linux. And he posited a third form of economic production, peer production. And it's really from open source peer production that the whole decentralized uh, cryptocurrency space arises. So we need to understand what that actually is. What the cryptocosm does, the real innovation, of course, is to add financial rewards and add a financial structure to peer production. Pure open source, people don't get paid. They do it for other reasons, and they create amazing pieces of software. Linux, uh, Wikipedia, you know, so much of the software relied on is done for free by open source collaboration. But cryptocurrencies add a whole new dimension to it. It integrates peer production with the free market and the firm, because the free market and the firm operate on money, whereas peer production didn't. This integration of peer production, of open source production, with the free market and the firm changes everything. It vastly expands the scope of peer production beyond geeks. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, the reality is most peer production is done by geeks. But cryptocurrency gives us a much broader world, and we see this already in Steam. So, Cryptocosm is the integration of all three economic forms by a flexible new type of money. Where is it superior? It's superior where the main component of something, of, of what you're producing, is human creative intellect. That's the main input. It's no good if your main input is aluminium or steel, but if the main input is human creative intellect, that's where peer production excels. And it's where information and allocation efficiency benefits exceed costs. And I'll talk about what they are, why open source works, even when people weren't paid. Peer consumption gives users control over content, security, and privacy. It's fundamentally superior to the centralized authoritarian Googleplex model. And I think, you know, I'm preaching to the converted on this, but it's important to understand that there's two sides to this. There's the consumer side, where we want a decentralized solution as users. And there's the production side, which of course, things like Utopian and things support, of how these things are created and how people are recompensed for, for their work. So two key areas of disruption, money, banking, finance, insurance, and the information economy, the whole online economy. But note here that it's not the whole world. We do have to realize that there are limitations. There's no point in decentralizing a, a steel mill. There's no point in decentralizing an airline. There's no point in decentralizing roads or car manufacturing or many other things. It's a big scope, the whole online world and finance and banking and money, but it's not everything. Because ultimately, 
the economy will find the most efficient things, ways to do things. And peer production, the cryptocosm, is the most efficient way in the online and financial world. So, what are these benefits? The first one is information efficiency. It is that the, in peer production, people identify for themselves who has the best set of skills for a particular job. The person themselves knows who, whether they've got the best set of skills and the motivation to do that. Not some boss who says, go do that, but you might be crap at that. Um, but, you know, you decide what you want to do. And that's why, that's why open source works, because people pick the jobs that they know they're best at. The second thing is allocation efficiency. A firm can only be so big. It's limited, um, as Coase talked about. So it can only have a certain number of people working for it and a certain resource matrix that can be addressed. But open source allows a much larger group of people to allow to address a much larger resource matrix. And that means it's much more efficient. So that's why even when open source had no payment associated with it, it was already super competitive in the world of software and other creative content. But there are costs. And as a crypto community, we need to talk about and understand those costs as well. Founders relinquish entrepreneurial control over the enterprise in a true decentralized model. That's the nature of decentralization. Being an entrepreneur is a centralized function, telling people what to do, directing the enterprise. When you decentralize, you have to relinquish that entrepreneurial control. And that's a difficult thing for entrepreneurs. It's something that every crypto project struggles with, the extent to which the founders move out. Satoshi Nakamoto just <laughs> walked out from the start, um, but in many other projects, they're still around. How much they've released control is contro controversial. How much is decentralized? Um, but you have to understand that consensus-based decision-making is slow and involves a lot more politics. So it works for some, with Bitcoin where it's just something stable and a currency and it does what it's going to do. That's fine. But when you have to move more quickly and adjust to the market, sometimes decentralization or full decentralization is not the best option. Um, and we'll talk about hybrids of how that's addressed. Founders give away ownership of the enterprise at the beginning. Now, that's hard. Um, you don't have any chance for Google and Facebook to buy you out. I'll talk about this later. You give away control at the beginning. You, you have your tokens, and you hope that, that those tokens do well. But there's no chance of a golden exit. A decentralized enterprise can't be sold or bought. The open source IP can't be bought or sold. It's inherently unable to be sold, so you can't have an exit. Token appreciation, rather than profit, is the main financial reward. And there's currently an issue with the holding and allocation of ICO funds. All these Swiss foundations that hold these ICO funds, they weren't designed for this purpose. They're not for profits. Um, they've got very limited goals. And if a crypto player wants to diversify into another area, they're going to have problems with their foundation. We're seeing this all the time. And it's a real issue that the crypto industry needs to deal with. What we're seeing now, and we're seeing on the Steam ecosystem, is the rise of hybrids. The cryptocosm allows hybrids of all three economic forms, the firm, the free market, and peer production, which maximizes the benefits and minimizes the costs. All the apps that we see on top of the Steam platform, Steam Monsters, Apex, all these, all these things are a hybrid because they are partly operating as a firm and partly operating in a decentralized peer production manner. And they're getting the benefits of both and minimizing the detriments. And that's why these, this is... At a fundamental economic level, it's a superior form that will prevail. It's not just because we think it will. It will prevail because it's fundamentally more efficient and more efficient economic forms will prevail. Um, the Steam blockchain is very interesting because it's decentralized what is it considers or the Steam founders consider the most important things. It's decentralized money and control. But it hasn't necessarily decentralized every aspect. Like, you know, DTube, you know, you don't have to decentralize, you know, your video storage to be a good solution on a blockchain. If that's, it could be an efficient manner, but it doesn't have to be. You've got to look at what needs to be decentralized, decentralized and what's actually efficient. 
Um, so we see this um, decentralization, it's the blockchain provides the infrastructure and it has enabled projects which are hybrids of the firm and peer production, Steam Monsters, Utopian, etc. We, we've heard some amazing talks today and all of these are examples of this. They're all competing, they, they are hybrid of firm and peer production and they're competing in the free market using Steam. So all three forms of production are working together and that is something new completely new in the world of economics. So, Facebook and Google. Facebook and Google developed some clever code 15 years ago and they've now eaten the internet. How have they eaten the internet? They've eaten the internet because they've had a strategic business model of acquiring early stage startups, any promising startup that could be competitive with them in the future, um, they've acquired and thus they've end run antitrust law that's supposed to stop people turning into massive monopolies because the tech space moves so quickly and the regulators don't have a clue and they've just eaten up the internet. But why is it, you know, you have to ask yourself a basic question. Why is a search algorithm firm owning so much of the internet? How did that happen? Search is like this much of the internet. Well, it happened because they were able to monetize first and then buy everything up. The same with Facebook. Social media is like this much of the internet. How come they own everything else? Because they monetized first and then they bought up everything else that could compete with them and now they own the internet and now they're starting to behave really badly. Um, the cryptocosm threatens them at two levels. It creates competitors that can't be bought. I don't think that can be said strongly enough. People don't understand this. It creates competitors that can't be bought. It fundamentally undermines Facebook and Google's expansion by acquisition business model. And the second thing is obviously, as we've talked about, that the fundamental product of the cryptocosm of decentralization is a superior model that provides users control over their security, content and privacy. George Gilder says that under the Google model, there's so little security, all power and money flows to the top because the system's completely broken. And in the cryptocosm, security will be the absolute core and thus the power and money will be at the bottom, will be with all the users, with all of you, with all of us not with big authoritarian companies. So what did they do? What did they do? They control 66% of all online advertising and they launched a massive censorship attack on their Cryptocosm competitors. The crypto ad ban started on the 30th of January 2018 and a week later, the crypto markets were down 53%. Now, we all know crypto markets were volatile, but they weren't that volatile. And it's very common if a company's share price drops by 10 or 20% when something happens, there's a class action about against that company straight away. This was a 53% drop. Um, not only was there negative effects on the markets, but crypto projects, crypto cosm projects struggled for the mainstream. A lot of people have talked about this at the conference, struggling for the mainstream. How do we get to the mainstream? The advertising to the mainstream is blocked. Normies use Facebook and Google. And so you can't get to them as a crypto project. It's very hard. It's caused a lot of damage. This ad ban is illegal. It's an anti-competitive action that is illegal under Australian law, probably European law as well. Um, under Australian law, we can sue them for anti-competitive cartel conduct enabled in claims for damages for all the losses that everyone suffered in the markets going down, all the losses that everyone suffered in their projects being able to advertise, we can sue them for the lot. That's $400 billion we're talking about here. And I, I don't use that term lightly. People think $400 billion. That's what the market dropped. $300 billion when Facebook announced and then another $100 billion when Google announced. So Australia has jurisdiction over Facebook and Google because they do business in Australia and they have large subsidiaries. Australia has good class action law and has a very clear breach of Australia's competition law. We're suing for damages. We're organizing a class action um, by the crypto industry. Anyone, everyone and anyone in the crypto industry can join up and you should join up, I'll explain why. To recover your losses, if you're down 50% on your crypto holdings, 
a significant percentage of that is going to be recoverable from the market drops and your project setbacks. A lot of projects have been badly set back by the crypto ad ban. And also, it's not just about money. It's about fighting back against this illegal censorship and attack on the cryptocosm. Look, we are making a better world. We are making a world where users control their privacy, content, and their security. They accused us of being like binary options. We should be outraged because it is outrageous what they did. And we're going to make sure they don't get away with it. So, the class action. It's free to sign up. It's a no win, no fee litigation where effectively by signing up, you're giving 30% of whatever damages you get to the people that are organizing it, which will help fund it. We are tokenizing the, um, the damages, so the token holders will get 25% of the damages and JPB Liberty for organizing will get 5% and that's how we're going to be raising funds to do the action. We've already got a lot of people signed up and we're getting close to the stage of starting to write letters of demand, legal letters to Facebook and Google. We've got all the legals sorted out. I'm, I'm a lawyer and I've done all the research on that. We've now got barristers in Australia giving us advice. So we really encourage everyone in crypto to sign up, particularly everyone here at this conference to sign up because if you don't sign up and it settles early, you'll miss out. Um, if it goes to court, probably, hopefully, we'll recover everyone's losses, but it could well settle, settle early. And in order to support this, the more people we've got, the more value we've got when we, when we go to Google and Facebook and, and say, you know, pay up, you've breached the law, um, the better, the more powerful our claim will be. And the also more powerful it will be in demanding that they immediately stop the crypto ad ban because they haven't stopped it. There was some slight modifications that meant only really big players who had licenses or were listed could um, get some advantage if they were in Japan or the US. It's just such limited exceptions. Most people still can't advertise. Um, important, um, it's confidential and anonymous. You know, we're in the crypto space. Our privacy is very important. You don't have to give any personal details. You sign up with a username of your own invention and two contact details, which can be new if you want them to be new. It's not, you're not on any court papers. Um, it's not disclosed to anybody. Um, it's just JPB Liberty has this, this information. It's not, it's not, um, it's not, could disclose to anybody. It's uh, it's confidential and anonymous, so you can be secure. I mean, you're not giving any any personal information in the first place, but even the limited information you are giving um, and verifying your crypto holdings is kept confidentially and securely. Um, and also, there's bonus tokens for signing up and for referring others to sign up. So when you sign up, you'll get a referral um, code to be able to sign other people up. Because of course, we're in the crypto industry. The tokens that pe are being sold. Um, to fundraise and that share in the percentage of damages are also given away as bonus for people signing up, depending on your crypto holdings. So I ask you to join now to secure your place in an early settlement. The details are here. You can, uh, you can scan that and uh, go straight to the sign up. The web, there's a website with lots of information. My details also are there. Um, if you want to speak to me, we've got a team of people in Australia and Israel working on this. And um, yeah, fight the good fight because we will win in the end. But if we don't fight, use all the legal rights we have, we're going to be held back. So we need to fight the fight and recover our losses. So thanks very much for, for listening today. Are there any questions? Sorry, questions. Any questions? Did oh, did it go? Oh, sorry. What happened to it? There we go. Yeah. No questions?
Was it me? It wasn't me. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Andrew. Thank you very much. See you for drinks? Yeah. Great. Yeah, dinner is here. Uh, well, not, not, not exactly here, but it, it looks like we're setting up a dinner table. That's true, but it will take a bit. But it's in this venue. Uh, into, mm, wow, well, it's only three o'clock. But they I'm sure she, they have something to drink right now for you. Yeah. Okay. Am I on? I'm on. Party, it's <laughs> okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we are immediately going to continue the program. I'm sitting here with, or I'm not sitting here. <laughs> Look at me standing. I'm here with uh, Jabab Matt and Andraki. Jabab Matt from co-founder of Steam Monsters, amongst many other things. And Andrew, obviously you saw him yesterday already interviewing Ned. Uh, Andrew, um, the um, content director yeah. of Steam it. Okay, an interview. The floor is yours, guys. Uh, you will be interrupted by a girl who will bring you some water. Thank you. That would be much appreciated. Yeah, so I'm uh, the content director for Steemit. Um, 
we the thanks for for coming to this talk i don't know if you guys even know what we're here to talk about uh but what we want what we thought would add the most value uh to the steam community the people here but also the broader blockchain community out there who might be watching this video uh in the future uh is going beyond the the technical aspect of the the technical challenges that people face uh, when they start building applications on, on a blockchain and, and tackle the next problem, which is, okay, great, you, you understand the technical details, you're building an application, but now you're an entrepreneur. Now you're building a business, whether you like it or not, and uh, there's, there's a whole new suite of problems you need to face if you want to uh, be successful. And so Matt has experience at uh, multiple startups and uh, before starting Steam Monsters, and it seems pretty obvious. Thank you, pretty lady. Um, <laughs> it, it seems uh, pretty obvious that he was able to integrate that, that knowledge and experience that he got uh, from working at those organizations when launching Steam Monsters with, with Agrode. And I, I thought, I, I think that, you know, based on my experience being, being on Steam for so long and being on kind of the leading development team uh, in the ecosystem, that this seems to be the biggest gap in, in the space right now is, you know, we, we've got great organic growth of, of developers, people coming to the platform because they like the ideas, they like the capabilities, and then realizing, oh my God, I can build something on this. Um, and so now it seems like the next kind of scaling challenge is understanding how to take a good idea and uh, it, that, that integrates a, a new technology, but building a sustainable and scalable business with it. So that's the goal here. Are there any, what are your first thoughts? What do you think would be the, the first thing we should tackle in this conversation? Yeah, um, well, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I agree that that's something really important that we should be talking about. Um, so, I mean, I'd like to start just on the main thing that I see is that it's okay to sell a product. Um, I feel like in the blockchain space, it's everything has to be free and we'll all just earn money because tokens will go up in value or there's inflation, you know, or reward systems or whatever. But um, I, I would like to see, you know, more blockchain businesses, apps, dApps, um, whatever you want to call them that, you know, understand that if you're building something, you're putting energy, you're putting time, you're putting money to build a product or a service that is helpful and beneficial to people, and it is okay to charge money for that. Um, you're not going against the ethos of, of Bitcoin, you know, because, you know, you're, you're charging money for a product. And I think a lot of the ethos um, of cryptocurrencies is not that everything should be free, but more that the the benefits, the rewards um, that you get should be spread out and decentralized. So you can still charge people to use your service or you can still sell a product. But I think the idea is that instead of having a company that is taking in and making all the rewards, that the people who are contributing and who are buying your product or using your service are able to also share in the value that they're creating. Yeah. I, uh that seems exactly right to me. Like the the foundational technology that that was de that was pioneered with Bitcoin, that you know, successive projects have have iterated on, is that you can reward people in stake for participating in in certain ecosystems. Uh, but that's it. It's not. It can't make everything free. It can't you know make computational work uh, infinite and 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 low cost. Uh, just because your app is free doesn't mean you'll have no costs. Right. And those costs will have to be paid somehow. And so thinking about uh, a product or a service that you can charge for uh, it isn't a bad thing. And it's, in it, it's incredibly valuable uh, if only for the information you get about what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. Yep. But the added benefit is that you can <laughs> fund operations pay yourself a salary and live a good life and, and and totally stealing from him here make your product better yeah Do you, so, wha, so so is it obvious to say that you know the more revenue you generate the more profit you generate the better you can make your your product and that's what it comes down to or what do you think 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, that is in the end, and I think it's been clouded a lot by the fact that there's been so much hype and speculation, so there's been so much money coming into block, the blockchain space just as investment or, you know, people just speculating. So everyone, there's been a lot of, oh, you know, we shouldn't charge anybody anything. You know, we don't take salaries. We don't do this um, because we can just get tons of money coming in, you know, from everyone who's just, oh, it's a blockchain. It's a cryptocurrency. Great. Take all my money. Um, but we're, we're past that phase or we're starting to get past that phase, right? So now it's not the, you just put blockchain in your name and you get all this money. Now it's, you actually have to make a good business and a good product. And to do that, you're going to need money coming in somehow. So initially it can be through funding that you go and, and get through a coin offering or traditional VCs. Um, or you can, you can uh, you know, start selling a product right off the bat and use your revenues to fund it. Um, but there's more thought that needs to go in. It's not just like make a token equals lots of money. It's, you know, you need to actually have a business plan um, and understand how you're going to grow and how you're going to continue to pay for your business, you know, pay back your investors, that type of thing. Okay, so, and, and you guys have done so, uh, some really interesting work with leveraging NFTs to, to be a component of that, which I don't want to get, really go into because it, it's, it's, it's technical, um, but I, I think it's worth looking into for other people. Like, there's a model there that other people can shamelessly copy and integrate into, into their business model, which I think they should. Um, but I, I think for the sake of this conversation, uh, maybe I, I think it would be better to move towards, okay, so I accept your premises. Uh, I, you know, I'm a developer. Uh, I've got an idea for a product. Um, and, and I agree that I should sell a product in, or, or service. What are the main challenges that I'm going to face as, let's say, a very small team, developer-centric team? I want to build a business. What do I do now? I'm also developing all the time, which I think is a big challenge that, that you face, which is that so much of your time is dedicated to actual development work. Yeah, so that's, um, that's really important because you need a good team, a well-rounded team with different skills and abilities. I find a lot of blockchain projects are just a few developers, and that's it. And they're building some really neat things, and it's great work, but then they don't know how to take it to the next level. And I, Ned also touched on this. Um, I forget exactly what he said, but it was like something about you know being able to have real success for blockchain-based businesses. And I think that's what he was talking about. You need, you need to take it to the next level where it's not just a few guys in a garage building something, which is kind of where we are right now, um, but to like an actually big successful business that has you know revenues and offices and you know employees and and all this stuff and that doesn't mean I, I think a lot of people think oh well that just sounds like traditional corporate you know not what we're doing here but just because you have an office and actual employees and you might even pay your taxes that doesn't mean you can't you know still be the the core ethos of the blockchain. Uh, and, and cryptocurrencies. That doesn't mean you can't reward the people who are providing value to your business, um, you know, the opposite of something like a Facebook or a, a Reddit. So, um, yeah, that's the biggest challenge, I think, especially for developers who just always want to focus on developing, is, is getting someone on your team that has a business background, right? I'm very lucky to have Agroad also, who, who helps out with that uh, a ton. Um, and it's hard for developers sometimes because the business background people, they don't care about what like really cool, great thing you might be building if it's not something that people are going to pay for or bring in revenue or, or move the business forward. So you need to, to have that give and take um, where you have people who are looking after the, the success and the future of your product and not just what cool technology you can build. Yeah, if you're not if you're not having arguments within your organization, you probably got like a mo monoculture that's yeah. that, that's not really going to be able to execute. It's like the quality and type of arguments that's the issue, not whether you're having arguments. Because the developer should want to focus on code and, and focus on solving technical challenges and should have their mind focused on that. And the business person should be focused on revenue and profit and the customer, customer, profits, revenues, and. Uh, yeah. You, you touched on a couple of, of, of really interesting points. Uh, um, I think that one of the w one of the most powerful underutilized tools of Steam is that 
you need to build a team. You need people who are different from you, and there's all these people out here who are, who are doing different things and telling you about all their skills, and why aren't you commenting on their post and asking them if they want to come on board? Uh, Renaud uh, Cryptoctopus uh, is a content creator who's now collaborating on Token BB, you know, a forum platform, and he's got a technical uh, co-founder, I think, is that, that that's right, right? So they're collaborating and they're combining their skills to so, you know, create a real product and, and working together. Um, there was another, there's another thing you said, working in the basement. Oh yeah, you shouldn't throw the baby out with the, the I, I think the key takeaway from the whole organization thing is that you shouldn't throw the baby out with the, bu with the bath water, where th we need to learn from organizations that have scaled to hundreds of people. If you're gonna build a successful business, you are going to have hundreds of employees, thousands of employees, and if you're not trying to employ hundreds of people and thousands of people, like. What are you doing? Like, come on, let's employ people. Let's make jobs. Let, let's create great organizations that people can be really happy in and fulfilled in. And, and, and we're like, you know, Steam Monsters can be a great company that can that can fuel the lifestyles of how many people, you know, how many passionate people can, can get involved. So um, you need to learn from centralized organizations that have been able to solve these problems of scaling an organization. And yeah, add your flavor to it, tweak it, make it better, I think trying to reinvent the wheel is definitely a way to set yourself up for failure. Is that fair? Yeah, uh, I agree with all that. Um, so I think you touched on a little, like it, it's kind of taking it to the next step. So there's a lot of businesses, dApps, whatever, that they, they make their thing, they put it out there, and that seems to be the end of their plan. You know, after that it's, okay, we'll add new features or we'll put new things in, but, um, you know, it, it's how do you, I, I don't see a lot of vision to, to grow to be like huge, right? How do you attract people from all over the world who aren't into cryptocurrency, right? That's, that's how we all, everyone talks about mainstream adoption of crypto and blockchain and everything. Well, if, if all the projects that are built are specifically built for people who are already in crypto and blockchain, it's not gonna do that. Like how do you, how do you make a product where people don't have to know anything at all about crypto um, or blockchain. They might not even know it's related to crypto and blockchain. And then how do you go and bring them in? Well, you have to have something better than the current centralized services that they're already using. It can't be like, you can't just go to those people and say, well, this service is worse in a lot of ways and it's slower and you know, et cetera, but it's decentralized, so you should use it. Like that doesn't work. It has to be at least on par with the centralized services that they're using. And you mentioned like kind of customer, customer first focus there. Um, that, that gets them in. And then hopefully by the fact that, you know, you're actually rewarding them for the value that they're bringing in, which they don't get on other platforms, you know, that, that tips the scales in blockchain apps favor. So that's, that's a big thing of what we're doing with Steam Monsters. So we just want to create a game that is great and at least on par or better with with everything else out there. So it's not like, oh, you know, Sea Monsters isn't so great, but I'm gonna play it because I support blockchain or whatever. It's just, Steam Monsters is an awesome game. I don't even know how it works. I don't know what's going on or what the Steam thing is. It just sounds like a misspelled word. Um, it's, you know, you come in because like, this is so cool, my friends were playing Steam Monsters and it's awesome, and you know, I'm playing it and it's fun. And then, then they realize that they're getting this stuff, right? <laughs> they're, they're earning these things and they don't know what it is. Um, but and it's theirs. <laughs> right, exactly. And eventually, so that, that's how I see, you know, a path to more mainstream adoption. You get people in because they're doing what they already like to do, and then, then they start realizing kind of what they have and what they've gained that they don't get from traditional games in this case. Uh, and that, that's how I see mainstream adoption happening. So that's why I'd like to see more apps trying to do the same of. Just make a great product and have the kind of crypto and blockchain part be the extra add-on rather than the main focus. Yeah, I think focusing on, uh, on mainstream adoption of, of blockchain is a very powerful orienting mechanism. Uh, the, the best projects to me seem to be uh, the ones that are going, we, we believe in block, I, it's what motivates us, right? We're like, we're like, we believe in blockchain. How do we get this into people's hands now? And it's one of my pet peeves when people say stuff like, uh, anyone can start participating by firing up a node. 
I'm like, you mean anyone who wants to fire up a node can participate? Right. Um, so is, did you want to say something? You looked pre pre prepared to. Oh, no, I was, just, I was just agreeing with that. That's a, that's a common thing that you hear. Yeah, yeah, sure, everyone can participate. You just have to go and, you know, sign up for this and save your private keys, and then you transfer it through this service. And, oh, if you do anything wrong, you're going to lose all your money, but don't, don't worry about that part, <laughs> you know. Um, so they don't, you know, and they just think that's okay because it's on blockchain, and that's how blockchain works. But um, it's all part of what I was saying, like you need to focus on the great customer experience and have the blockchain and crypto be behind that. Yeah, and I think it's especially important because it, uh, the, the mindset towards mainstream adoption aligns you psychologically with the core value proposition of Steam. So if you're building a Steam app, Steam is an application specific protocol that's effectively laser focused on mass adoption. So if you're pursuing a business model or ambition that is at odds with that, you're gonna be run, going against the current. Like if you don't wanna you know, spur mainstream adoption, uh, you're, you're, you're not gonna be tightly aligned. Um, so I think um, the, next, the next question would be, okay, so, oh, and the, the last point I wanted to make is that, you know. Often people go, yeah, but there's X, Y, and Z, which makes this not ready for mainstream adoption. And I think the insight there is that that's actually where the value is. Like that, you guys said, you know, these are the what is lacking in Steam right now. This is what we like. We like uh, the, uh, these trading card games. And we see a way to integrate our passion with a gap in the market that we see here and then rapid success because Steamians, it resonates with Steamians, so that enables you to accelerate like the adoption curve and kind of bootstrap your, your application, which I guess hopefully now the plan is to leverage that early success to uh, continue building and, and, and spread it out to a mainstream audience, is that fair? Yeah, and I think so Steam specifically is a, an awesome bootstrapping platform, right? I, I'm pretty sure if we made Steam Monsters, if it was EOS Monsters or whatever other chain, there's a lot of there's a lot of technologically, um, you know, chains that are technologically similar to Steam at this point that we could have built it on, and I don't think we would have ever been able to get the community that we have, get the amount of players that we have, and the the support and raise the amount of funds that we had on any other blockchain. So Steam, I look at it as such a great way to bootstrap things because we have all of you, everyone here, the community is Steam's big value. That's what I've been trying to say. But then, and a, a lot of the apps just stop there. So they, they come, they make something, they get the great Steam community and they're all on and then that's it. That's the end of their business plan. And then they just hope Steam will grow so they get more users. But I wanna take it to the next level. Okay, you use Steam, you bootstrapped, you got a lot of people, you got funding thanks to delegation um, or whatever it is. But now I wanna see a lot of these apps say, okay, how do we go out and get everybody else in the world who is not in this room or on Steam into Steam and into using our apps. Um, so have you ever had any experience like pitching to investors or VCs or, uh, and, and is there anything you've, you've learned from that experience that, that can give people insight as to what they need to do next if they manage to build this successful cool app on Steam but they're trying to figure out where to go from there? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, you know, I think it would be a, an eye-opening experience for a lot of, um, a lot of blockchain apps to pitch to, to venture capital investors. And like I said, in, in the past, it's been, they don't need to do anything except say blockchain, oh wait, here's, here's all the money that you need. <laughs> but we're getting past that stage. And so now they're gonna have to pitch to investors that aren't just throwing their money at any blockchain project, but they wanna, they wanna see real business plans, right? They don't wanna say, they don't wanna see, oh, I have a community of a few thousand you know, active people on Steam, they want to see how can we grow to hundreds of thousands of active users, right? They don't want to say, oh, you know, we're giving our product away for free because it's a, a great, you know, and You thing. should love it because it's cool, isn't right. it? Right, <laughs> yeah. Like, well, uh, we don't have to fund it. <laughs> you know, they're, like traditional venture capital that's not in a craze is not going to go for any of that. And a lot of them, you know, we, it's great that, that you guys delegate to help a lot of the projects, you know, with their initial funding. 
but I would really like to see projects on Steam go out and get external funding. Steam Monsters didn't get a delegation. We have not gotten a delegation. That's why. <laughs> so <laughs> successful. Victim of your own success. But it also, pro it also proves that you don't need to. Right, and, and I, I that... we, we aren't asking for one either because um, there, there are other ways um, to, to be successful and to, to get money. So I'd love to see um, some apps really have a business plan that shows how they can grow to be hundreds of thousands, millions of users, how they can make revenue and still, you know, still be able to distribute the, the profits out um, to, their, to their users, to the people who bring value and then go out and use that and bring in investment. I think that's a critical insight because if you're developing an app and you're planning on launching an SMT, you, your, your users, your, certainly your power users, you're, they're, you're basically going to be pitching to them as if they are a VC, where you're mm -hmm. going to be saying, come in here because you're going to be earning these tokens, and these tokens are going to become incredibly valuable because we're building something incredibly great. You're going to have to pitch, pitch that to them, and they're not going to take, like, oh, it's just going to be great because it's free and we have no revenue. and we have. So uh, where do they go from there? So what, what is an investor looking for? What do they want to hear from an app developer other than, it's so cool and it leverages Steam in a super interesting way. And we've we've got a lot of users because we've got 10% of the Steam user base. Right. Yeah, they um, they have very, it's very clear. And I think every investor that I've talked to kind of wants to see the same things in a business plan and they evaluate the same things. And one thing that I think is especially lacking in a lot of blockchain and Steam businesses is the market size, right? So if we went to investors, Agro and myself, we can show the market size of digital trading card games, right? We can show Hearthstone. We can show Magic the Gathering. We can show billions of dollars. And this is, this is even just a subset of the full gaming industry that we might be able to market to. And we can show there is billions of dollars being spent on this type of product right now. So that's, that's the first thing uh, investors look at that should be in a pitch deck is like, this is the market I'm going after. Um, so then after that, you know, they want to see how you're going to capture that market, right? Um, I think that we have a pretty good, uh, you know, way to show that. I mean, A, we've had a little success so far. That is always helpful. Um, but you want, to, you want to show why your product is, is better than the others and why people who are spending billions of dollars on these other products are going to come now and spend it on your product instead. So the reason that ours is is because, and this is a big reason why I wanted to create Steam Monsters in the first place, is I played Hearthstone, I played Clash Royale, I played all these games. All the money I spent is spent and gone, and all the, the things I've gotten are stuck in my account in those games. You know, I, I gave the money to the company, I played the game. I, I have no way to get anything back from that. Um, that what's the difference now with digital assets and you know true digital ownership that we can provide by doing this on a blockchain is that if you come and you buy Steam Monsters cards, those are your cards, right? We, we literally cannot say that you cannot transfer them or that you cannot sell them or anything like that. So they, they are, everyone can, um, uh, if, if I have a Hearthstone card, I have no idea how many there are, right? Hearthstone could just go and make 20 million of them if they want, you know, and we have no idea. So on the blockchain, there's true digital scarcity. Everyone can verify how many of those cards exist, which, you know, leads to their market price, right? Um, and then everyone's free to sell and trade them. So that's what we're going after. I think that's a powerful message if we go to people who play traditional digital games and we are able to get this message across to them where they're not really spending money in our game. It's, it's an investment. It's sort of like buying Steam or buying Bitcoin. And on top of that investment, they can also use it to play the game. And if they spend a lot of time playing the game and they're good at it, they can earn more you know, of those, those cards that, have, that potentially have value or potentially higher value in the future. So that's, that's sort of our, our pitch that I would make to venture capitalists if and when we were to go uh, try to get them. Here's the market size, um, and here's how we can go get that market. Yeah, I think the key takeaway from there, from that, for me, is um, understanding that a good technology gives you some slight edge over your competitors. It's going to be more difficult to scale because it's new, 
but it gives you some kind of edge and understanding on a very deep level what that edge is and how you can exploit it to create a superior business model in some, usually for a niche, usually for some small niche that can, that can grow because that addresses the scaling issues. Um, that, that's a, a key insight. Um, I think, so you've got, uh, so, so you've got a, a value prop. Oh, I think a, another thing uh, that you guys did that was brilliant was you built in a mechanism, whether intentionally or not, for, I see too many entrepreneurs in the space thinking that the way to get an investor is to explain to them how it's going to work and why it's going to work. But what you guys did is you sold starter packs and then you created booster packs. And what you have with booster packs is a very objective metric for how engaging the game is. Because you can see how many people start, how many people come in, presumably the people who get the starter packs, and then you can see exactly how excited they are about playing the game, how sticky the game is, because oh, the average user acquires 10 booster packs, and that's something you can actually, you know, uh, uh, I think a VC would be much happier to hear, to, to see, to hear you say, every, you know, for, for every user we onboard, they purchase 10 booster packs, as opposed to, this game is so sticky that people are gonna love playing it all the time, and even, even a metric like number of games played, to me, isn't as robust as this is how many booster packs they buy. Was that intentional? Was it a f fortunate accident? No, that's, I mean, that's just part of selling a product, right? So, yeah, if you're going to have a much easier time raising capital and building your business, um, if you have success to show, like monetary success, like people are actually putting money where their mouth is to, to use your product. And, um, you know, again, as part of the whole like pitch deck to venture capitalists, what they also want to see is um, how much it costs you to bring in each new player and what the lifetime value of each player is. Because that's what makes a business successful or not. It's that simple calculation. If it costs you less to bring in a customer than the average customer spends, you will have a profitable growing business. And if not, you will fail. Um, so, so that's, and if, you can, you can go and tell a venture capitalist that you think this is how it will work, um, but if you've actually done it a little bit already and you can see it, so it's worked so far in this little bit, that, that makes all the difference sometimes. You can actually prove to them that the numbers you're showing are not made up or you know, uh, that are, they're achievable. Um, and that also just gets into another thing is marketing. I mentioned how much it costs to bring in new, new people. Um, so Steam, as I mentioned, is awesome because you can go out and build something and get 1,000, 2,000, even more people using it for free. Um, there's not a lot, there's no blockchains, at least, that I know of that do that. There's probably no other platforms I know of that do that. So use that, get your start, and then, then you got to say, okay, now how, what's my marketing plan? And you're going to have to spend money. So that's where either the venture capital money that you bring in helps or your, the product that you're selling helps. You spend the money, you bring in the customers, and you earn more. You may give a lot of that money back to your customers, which is great, but to have a sustainable business, you need to earn more on average per customer than it costs to acquire them. Yeah, so it's fairly normal to, to, to reinvest a lot of the early money that you get I into like the customer acquisition and, and, and building the experience. How long, uh, w what time horizon do you think people should establish for themselves as far as generating kind of surplus revenue that isn't just being pumped? Because that's another problem I see is that people People go, so they, they get to the next step of the business plan where, where they're actually generating revenue and then they go and all of it will go back into the business forever. And I'm just like, yeah, but a year from now you're gonna get tired of this and then two questions or two minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes. You're gonna get tired of this and you're gonna drop this because it can't fund your lifestyle and that, that's really important. So what kind of time horizon should people look at maybe? Yeah, the time horizon is different for every business, and it's kind of how quickly you want to grow and how quickly you want to do things. So there's there's a there's definitely a bootstrapping phase where you don't like take huge huge salaries, right? You you kind of pump everything back into the business to try to grow it. 
and that's kind of that's kind of the tipping point where you either make it or break it. Um, so, you know, it's it's unique for each business, but certainly after that initial bootstrapping phase, if you have a successful product, you have customer acquisition channels, you're you're making more than it's you're spending in marketing. Yeah, then it's important that uh, your employees have salaries and that you know they're not just bootstrapping forever and ever and ever because that just creates the. Uh, you know, a problem where people just say, well, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And if your key people can't support their lives and, and they leave, then, then you're going to be done too. They're going to work somewhere else and there's going to be a conflict somewhere. Yeah. So is there any last minute thing, like a any last minute message you want to get out to, to anyone watching or listening about what they need to know to build a successful business on blockchain? I will say it's to summarize, summarize what I've said here. Look at it as if you need to pitch this business to traditional venture capitalists who are not just throwing their money at blockchain companies. I think that's good. Yeah, even if you're not planning to talk to VCs, I still think it's a really helpful exercise. Yeah, I mean, because VCs look at that n just because they, that's what makes a successful business, yeah. right? Yeah. So whether or not you're pitching to VCs, <laughs> you want to do the things that will make your business successful. They're not stupid. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Matt and Rocky. Thanks a lot, guys. All right, moving on to another oh, one of the white chair chats. White chair chats. Uh, yeah, I think you can put it here. Yeah, no problem. And Voronoi, right? Sorry? Voronoi is going to join. And crypto. I'll talk not very long, maybe five minutes tops. I think it's best to do this if you're going to go out. Okay, yeah, fine. Yeah. Yes, yes. All right. Hello, hello. Yes, this works. Test, test, testing. It's all good. All right. It's good to see that even at four o'clock, almost, there are still people here. And not everyone having to go home and sleep before uh, the night of steam. So, uh, I'm going to do a short presentation followed by a panel session. Uh, and uh, my name is Frederik Oresta. You know me probably best from Steam Press, which is an application on the Steam blockchain. And uh, I'm here to have a panel on the topic of Steam everywhere on the web, how to, we can take the blockchain to other websites. And I realized the more time I've been here at Steam Fest this year, how relevant this topic is because the message is quite different from last year and the year before, where a lot of the focus or the hype was, let's build this site, Steam it, and it's going to be the next Reddit, it's going to be the next Facebook. Now the message and the hype is more, let's bring this thing everywhere on the web, let's tokenize the web, let's, take the pot let's build many applications, let's build many apps. And so I wanted to have, give a few thoughts uh, myself, because this is very much what Steam Press is doing, but also include some other uh, panelists who are very much working with their own websites that are outside of the traditional Steam-based apps that you know, how we can do it better and what it really means. So the questions that I want to just give out to you people and then give to the panelists too are first, what does it actually mean to tokenize the web? And I, I'm sure that Everyone has now heard this word, but if I ask what does it mean, I'm pretty sure that most people here have a very different first thought. Or, and that's one of the challenges, but also the exciting things about the decentralized blockchains that there's different people have different visions, want to go different places. But uh, I want to give them also the question, opportunity to ask what does it really mean? 
Second, what competitive advantages can Steam bring to websites and blogs that implement it? As Yabamat said in the last interview, you know, we're past that time where you can just say, now we are on the blockchain, now throw money at us. If you want to really get people to implement and use SMT, it's not just, it's because it's a token. It has to actually give a competitive advantage that makes sense outside of the whole token economy. And third, what are the biggest challenges in convincing hosts of normal websites to try having an SMT, to try using blockchain? So in other words, what have we really been talking about the last two days? What, why does it matter? And how can we work as a community to make it work? So first, I just want to give a very brief visualization of how we in Steam Press view this. We sort of see a landscape where there's thousands and millions of new blogs coming online that are desperate to build their own communities, that are desperate to build their own followers and to get seen. But it's, in reality, it's a little bit of a ghost town and a, and a lot of empty websites with just the author and their mom and their sister. But what we hope is that the blogs that connect to Steam Press take their communities of interest, connect them to the Steam blockchain, and thus reach a whole ecosystem of applications where they can connect with the similar communities around the web. So uh, to say it short, I mean, Steam Press is the portal between every individualized blog on the internet and a content distributing a monetization strategy that is accessible by the Steam blockchain. So some of answers from my side to those questions is that the benefits of Steam to, to, to uh, new users is that it allows authors to have a more direct relationship with their audiences through making them the co-owners and co-creators of the whole blogging experience that it allow visitors to engage directly with the content and more and the author, because now it doesn't matter what website you're on, you're directly there with the creator, you're tipping them, you're uploading them, you're curating them, and vice versa. And last, it allows the owners of the website to incentivize the positive engagement interactions they want on the site in order to grow and retain uh, more loyal visitors. So I think this is really what you have to go and tell to a uh, sport website that, of why should they have a, a token? Well, maybe they already have, a, they are a medium-sized uh, website, they have $10 million worth of revenue. If they bought 500 or rented 500,000 Steam and, or had their own token, could they then incentivize the type of engagement in the comments, reward back to their most loyal visitors, to then maybe steal some of the visitors from similar uh, blogs, similar websites over to them, thus taking their yearly revenue from 10 million to 12? And would that, thinking from the Steam perspective, then help create a more sustainable equilibrium price for Steam, where there's a willingness to pay for Steam tokens to run a business independently of the revenue you get from author rewards and, and uh, benefactor rewards. And not to tease it too much, but I think actually the, the, the real thing that can take away sort of the bid bot economy is not only different economic rules, but businesses that provide better return on investment on use of SP by running an additional business model on top of the business that they can already run on the blockchain, thus increasing their willingness to pay for the tokens more than just if you use them isolatedly on the chain. So those are my thoughts, but as you probably noticed, I'm not alone here. So I want to introduce a panel. Unfortunately, we're only three out of four. Uh, GMAX had to go home a bit early, but without further ado, I want to introduce you two other great minds here on the panel. You've probably heard from them in other talks uh, today or yesterday. Uh, first is Cryptoctopus, who has Token BB and also uh, a website called Dapp Central IO. And the second is Voronoi, who's been with Sandbox and also has a website called Crypto, uh, Creative Crypto. I've come to know these people because they've been two of the first active users of Steam Press. So I know very well that they have their own websites that, are, that look good, that ha are not on Steamit but where you can go now with the Steam account and engage with our content. So uh, since I have more time than I originally thought, Roland, I <laughs> want to give them a minute just to introduce what you're doing and uh, who, wh wh what are your websites like, and then I want to go through the questions that I had in the beginning. Excellent. Um, well, I guess, is this, is this working? Here we go. 
thank you, Frederick. Uh, I'm Kirk or Voronoi or Sandbox or Creative Crypto, lots of different names, but um, I'm a co-founder of Sandbox and we have a creative studio in Brooklyn uh, that has created the Creative Crypto magazine, which uses Steam Press as part of it. Um, and we really did this out of a, a kind of necessity to find a new website that wasn't so focused on the financial aspects of cryptocurrency, but more on the creative applications that people are using blockchain in the kind of art world. Um, so we have a website, thecreativecrypto.com, which I encourage everyone to check out. And uh, that's, that's a little bit about me. Great. Test, test. All right. Yeah, my name is uh, Cryptoctopus, but my, my real name is Renault. Uh, I'm from Montreal, Quebec, uh, Canada. And yeah, so I've got to learn about Steam Press. I got excited right away uh, and uh, launched my own WordPress site being like, because I'm always on the hunt for uh, the latest dApp and application on Steam. And I was going to write about it anyway. So I decided to launch uh, dappcentral.io, and whenever I want to write about an app, uh, whether on Steam or not, I use that, that, that way to reach out and uh, monetize my blog, which it's funny because, because for two years, I just blogged every day on my own WordPress website, hoping to make money blogging. You know, when, whenever you go on Google, and you, how do I make money blogging online? And you have those, those gurus. Um, for a while, I tried and it failed. And um, but thanks to Steam Press, um, now I can people can actually monetize their blog and uh, get engagement. If it's not money, it's actual engagement. People uh, commenting. But uh, my, the main project right now is Token BB, which is um, a forum interface over the Steam uh, blockchain, where we we want to get people uh, to to focus on conversation rather than blogs so and communities. So it, they're, they're both very uh, working together. The, the publisher who wants to, um, to promote their topic and the community they want to build around that topic. So that's, that's for me. Great. So I've given you the luxury of already having shared with you some of the questions that I wanted to raise. But I also want to raise them to the audience because I want to invite you to give some, share some of your thoughts on the questions or ask either of us questions afterwards. So please just formulate them in your head if you have them. But I can start with you. Uh, when someone says tokenizing the web, I mean, what do you picture and what does that mean to you? Um, it's, it's an interesting question. It's a huge buzzword that just it literally is, you know, propagating through the web right now. But I, I think how it resonates most right now is everyone knows that we live in a content economy where all of everything that's created within the social media world has this incredible value that then gets propagated through the web. And I think a lot of people are focused on what's the, the, the big thing you hear after that is what's the killer dap? What's the dap that's going to like make this accelerate through? And I think a lot of people are starting to say now, and I've, I've seen this by a, a friend of ours, Jason Bailey, who's a crypto artist. He said, uh, well, content is the, maybe the next killer dab, or art is the next killer dab, or it might be just the stories that are coming out of this space that are able to kind of virally kind of propagate through the web in a way that uh, yields value. And I think that's what tokenizing is about, is about kind of uh, discovering that value, but also providing metrics for it that allow it to propagate through the web in a healthy way, in a way that kind of allows us to understand more of how these stories got there and learn more about it. It's basically smart content, in my opinion. Mm. Great. Cool. Yeah, really both great answer. I loved your answer, too. Um, and I've been thinking about this this question for a lot, and I don't think I've completely dig as far as I can uh, about this idea of tokenizing the web. But I can s the way I kind of frame it for myself is an internet of value on things that previously were a commodity. Um, you can. You can attach a token to it. It doesn't have to be monetary. Maybe it can be uh, access token to a membership website. Maybe it can be um, brownie points. Thank you for helping me out. Uh, it's, it's propagating the, the token so that you can create incentives, uh, monetary or not, around your particular topic of interest. I think that, that it allows to, to attach a, uh, a unit uh, of, of measure on things that were previously really difficult to, to put on. Um, 
And yeah, that's that's how I see a lot of tokenizing the web, and it's a lot to do with incentives. And it's for me, it's a difficult. You know, every technology has its pluses and minuses. I always try to see both sides uh, aside of the idea of like tokenizing the web. A lot of people get really excited. Let's let's go out there. This is the best thing since sliced bread. But we also have to be careful that we don't denature the normal relationship that we have with other people by only attaching a monetary value on things. Um, where when you add a, a monetary uh, aspect, people start behaving differently than if it was simply out of goodwill. And uh, we have to mitigate those two things. So for me, what, what it means to connect the web is to be also careful about the incentives we create so that we still have a genuine relationship with each other. Right, I think I like the idea that the condition has that we don't want to call it money, we want to call it hearts. So you know, yeah. you give hearts, and maybe that has a psychological effect that you you, you think differently when you're transitioning you hearts and you give the out yeah. hearts. Yeah. Right. So second then, what competitive advantages does using Steam in webs other websites really give? Why does cr the creative crypto want to be on Steam, or why does Sandbox, what can you do with with it that you can't do without it? Well, it, it's one of the reasons for that. I, as a designer, I have a background in architecture, actually, in art. And for me, Steam was this kind of super, superpower sort of cryptocurrency that made it, for creators, it's agile. It gives you agility, I guess, is the answer. That, you know, as an artist, I can go, depending on the medium that I want to create, I can go on Steam it to write about it. I can go on DTube to take a video of me you know, drawing something, or I can go on these different platforms to fundition to help fundraise for it. It gives you more agility as a creator where you can carry your audience through that creative process where for other platforms, you're stuck within a certain media. On Instagram, you can only do so many things that you can't really, and you can also build up your audience on, on Instagram, but as soon as you take that to Medium or to Twitter, you have to build up a new audience that's totally different. But for an artist, that's, it's an incredibly empowering infrastructure where you can uh, really empower the process of your work and start to not only mitigate the cost of that work and, and kind of tokenize the process of it, but you can develop and cultivate an audience that can really help you do this. And with the Creative Crypto Magazine, that's the audience we're really trying to speak to. These creatives who feel disenfranchised, who feel like they're not being heard or they don't have the right resources to bring their work forward, uh, Steam is the infrastructure we use for the magazine, and it's something that we try to weave and integrate into the narratives that we tell. And that that's so far really resonating with people as soon as they dig down into that rabbit hole a bit further and understand more about it. Yeah, I like that you answer like this from the point of view as you as a creative initial user of Steam, because it's also more or less the same answer I give when I say, why am I bullish on Steam? It's the fact that it may only take one dApp to rock it for the whole ecosystem to follow, so that if there's one app that suddenly gets a lot of attention, a lot of people wanting to sign up, creating an account, the barrier to then have those people move across uh, vertically oh, yeah. in the, to all these other applications you know, is much easier. So it's in Steam Press's best interest that DTube or uh, Steam Monsters and you know, every one of you guys succeed. And it goes both ways, so I think that's a very powerful thing, and it's great then to hear it from from you as too that this is something that you as a user appreciate as well. Definitely, I, th I think if uh, all of us creating these products, it's the big question is would you yourself use it? If that's you know if you're if I'm going to the Creative Crypto magazine as as an artist, is this useful for me? Is this empowering to me? Does this do anything? And uh, the answer always for any of us, I think it has to be yes. Like let's create things that we ourselves would use as a consumer, as a kind of creative person. Yeah, yeah, I really like what you talked about and touched because for me it was a, one of the big selling point of Steam is that whatever audience you build on this network is everywhere. So whenever I launched mm -hmm. Dapp Central, uh, two years later after launching my, my account on Steam, instantly I had comments under my blog. Which, you know, if you're a blogger and you, you try a long time and try to build an audience, it's the hardest thing. And, you know, whenever you get your real genuine comments for the first time, it's like a trophy moment. But all of a sudden, you're able to build an audience that will follow you across all of those apps if, they, if you know, more and more robust apps are built on top of it. Um, 
another competitive advantage. I think, of course, the, like, there's the incentive that you can create that are um, where <coughs> your user, if, like, for example, you have a uh, smart media token, are invested in the success of your platform. So it's much easier to, to create a, a way for people to care about whatever you're building. So uh, on, a, on a monetary, kind of like almost equity side, it's like, well, what if I became a, um, a constant commenter on the New York Times? I don't know if they allow comments anymore, but uh, <laughs> if, the, if, you, if you had a stake in the success of a newspaper or an online publication, then yeah, you would come and want it to, to be part of it. We'd be happy to share, uh, sh share them and have thoughtful comments. Um, what else? There's, of course, it, it's, it's out of every other crypto I can think of, it's, it's much more easy to implement into a website, especially with a plugin like you're, you're building. Um, yeah, I think really in community building, Steam is, is, is is the most social of all cryptocurrencies I've been able to see so far. It's the one that people will will use to build communities, uh, and and that's I think that's the next step in Steam development is for people to on website to be able to group together um, and band in their in their little tribe, and uh, maybe bootstrap their s smart media token, or you just use the Steam as a way to incentivize the, 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 the interaction that you want within that. Yeah, that's good too. I mean, going back to the community, I had a conversation with someone the other day and it just thought, and it was just sharing that from Steam Press's side, we always thought that people would install it because they want to earn money. It's a first top of the list argument, but the more blogs I've been talking with and more bloggers, they when you start talking about earning cryptocurrency, there's a level of skepticism, whilst when you start talking about the ability to reach communities of similar interest, there's an immediate accept because everyone who has a blog wants more content consumers, more people coming back to their website. And if you say, hey, we have access to this network where there are people consciously working to connect and curate your type of content and sharing it with people of similar interest, that's very powerful. And when we're then you know, pitching Steam Press, if, if I'm going to a science writer, I'm saying, look, there's all these science enthusiasts and writers on this platform. Of course, I have an easier time selling the product if the, if the science community has 10,000 rather than 5,000 members or 100,000 rather than 10,000 members. So there's a two-way incentive there for the dApps to grow the communities and for the communities to grow the dApps. I think yeah. this is something that I think needs more discussion is how can we make it so that dApps plus communities equals true. And it's not just people developing dApps in one corner, people curating communities in another corner and there's less interaction. Yeah, I think another thing that it brings is that a lot of writers are not marketers and website sometime in order to be monetized, of course they have to build membership websites, they have to have ads, sometime pop-up ads and all those those gimmicks to get people to buy, which is there, which is nothing wrong with it, but to add an extra layer of monetization, maybe not the old stream of, of, of income, but they, hey, you have a distribution mechanism through Steam and also the possibility of, hey, if you make enough, maybe you can reduce the amount of ads so that you have better retention on your website or, you know, like being able to, to create a better user experience overall by reducing those like aggressive advertising. Uh, a more like easy, a softer way to, to, to interact with their content. So it's another, another competitive advantage I could see for improving the, the experience of the user at the end by reducing the amount of ads. Um, that could be an advantage. Yeah, I mean, it's all about making the website better. Uh, we all want to stimulate a competition of creating the best value for people. I mean, what, what else is there to do? And then the more value you create for the people who are the consumers of your content, hopefully the more they'll be willing to pay in terms of actually buying something or coming back so that they are re you have higher time on site per user on your platform and thus earn more money. So then Steam Power and Steam Blockchain is like a resource for, for powering a business that isn't only dependent on the rewards within the ecosystem. And I think getting more people to see that 
is also a little bit of the answer to the previous panel about how can we have more sustainable business models because then suddenly you know it's uh, there's a business on its own that's being driven further by it but right. but okay so that's where we want to go but what's the how why is it difficult to get there or rather how can we work together to get more people to be to want to have steam on their platforms want to have maybe their own smts you guys have been talking with some yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's a huge challenge. It's it's definitely the industry is facing this as a whole. Like, how do we relay information better? How do we visualize this ecosystem better? And I think a lot of it has to do with navigation of good resources, mm -hmm. uh, bolstering the the crypto fluent people that we have to the good crypto fluent people that we have to the limelight to better explain and better showcase precedence of what this can do. And I think a lot of it has to do with precedence, so people can visualize themselves through you know through uh through steam monsters through a game they can see like okay steam can be used in this context or steam can be used in this context we need to create more uh different types of examples of what this can do because mm -hmm. steam is is definitely uh I'll, I'll borrow a word from matt pandora's box in a lot of ways that you can apply it in so many different circumstances and you know we have such a diverse community here of people creating their own precedents we just need better mechanisms to put those up on a platform and get better better visibility for them. And I think that's, I, it's a secret sauce question that I think we're gonna battle for a while probably. Yeah, I think when I was pitching the idea, I think the biggest uh, hurdle is actually word blockchain. You know, we, uh, a, lot, a lot of people talk about, we gotta educate people to, to come into Steam. And I think it's a, it's, it's a terrible idea uh, because people don't want to be educated. Uh, they, they just want to use your product. They, w they want to say, hey, what have I got to, to get out of this? How, how can I better my life? What kind of value have to propose and make it easy for me to start? And, and that is one of the things that's been most difficult. It's like, well, okay, get, like, for example, I have a forum. Uh, I have 2,000 users. Um, why should I use your service and how can you make it as easy as possible for me like a click of a button so can I can migrate am I gonna like all the technicality is in the way of the the actual users and that's the the biggest thing is that we don't in my opinion we don't have to explain what blockchain is we have to give people an on-ramp and a, a, a and then an UI that makes it so intuitive that you don't, you know, nobody, when people go to wordpress.com and they want to start a blog, they're not, it's, there's so many things that are out of their way in terms of decisions that they have to make. They just have to enter their name, their email, and they have their, their step by step, the, the complicity, the, the, what, what's complicated is broken down in so many different steps that everything seems easy in tiny bit, but trying to, to cram everything on the front. Um, and that's why I like what Utopian has been talking about last, uh, yesterday at the presentations. Like, let's get people to interact with our website even though they don't have a Steam account. Mm. Let's them get participating. And then at some point, maybe we're gonna send them a notification, say, hey, synchronize your, your account with Steam and uh, earn additional dollars. Okay, you know, like, and then you can step by step walk them through rather than front loading <laughs> with with information and i think that's the most difficult thing is giving people an easy solution to just mm. jump on board um without being overwhelmed by by all the technicality of blockchain and the ui is so so important and i think you know we see a lot of apps that are uh, steam apps too that are creating like a steamit.com plus this yes. feature yeah. And it's it's almost like, well, okay, maybe steamunder.com is more a sum of all parts that we should be boiling down or distilling into more simple things that are like, you know, just one functionality from here, one functionality from here, and make it so much more simple and, and easy for someone to come in and just just use it yeah. and, and just enjoy using it. Yeah, and for the app developer to not think, we well, here's this toolbox, let's use all of it. Right. Well, maybe you just need custom JSON. Maybe you only need the upvote. Maybe there's things that are not a part of Steam that you can do central. Like that's one of the things that you can do on your UI. You don't 
it doesn't doesn't all need to be on the blockchain. I'm, I'm sure some people are going to be mad at me for saying that, but for uh, you know people believe everything has to be on the blockchain. But in, in terms of, of a, a user perspective, in the end, they don't really care. They want to use a good product that works well and that does what it, its its intended purposes is without as little um, barriers in the way to, to get there. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I we, we had a, a round table earlier today about what will it take to create mass adoption and that was like one of the questions too. And I like to say that if your best answer is we need more user education, try again. Because you, that you have to make it so that they don't need to be educated. It's a rose path from adoption to mastery. And yeah. uh, you know, you can't just take them all all the tools and just dump them in the labs and expect them to, you know, figure it out. I think uh, just like the entrepreneur needs to create a minimum viable product, I think they need to impose minimum necessary technology or ne minimum necessary information <laughs> as a sort of, no, but seriously, as a way to, first, you what you just want to engage in the comments, you want to curate uh, the author, and uh, after a while, because it takes a while to actually earn something of meaning, and then it can be, okay, now you actually earned five bucks, now here's, uh, here's how you can Get buy a out. cap in, with this SMT token in our store, or here is how you can, know, transfer it to, to buy something else. And it's, you know, if, if Steam can figure out that kind of magic entry point, then as soon as that happens and people realize, oh, I don't need my Twitter password here, my Facebook password here, it, there are all these other gateways that are actually blocking people across other social networks today. As soon as people realize that they can migrate from A to B, Steam apps to Steam app and just use it, I think, and, and like the new keychain uh, solution for logging into Steam apps, I think those things are starting to provide more solutions that will make that just a lot more compelling. But yeah, I think, I mean, I'm a designer. I, I like pretty things. So yeah. <laughs> I like I like good websites, and it's it's that's definitely something that's needed. All right. I, I certainly could voice a few opinions myself more, and I have some backup questions myself. But before going on, I really want to see if there's anyone in the audience that want to weigh in on anything that has been discussed so far, or just raise a question to some of the panelists there, I would really love that. Anyone? Please. I know there's always <laughs> someone with a question, but there's a little bit of barrier. I have a few questions that I can ask as, as a thought. Um, so to me, tokenizing the web is just simply how do we use the web to transfer value? Like a token is a unit of value. And so I just look at it. Um, like, let's say I read someone's blog and they're in another country, yeah, even if they're in the same country, how do I transfer some value to them, right? Try transferring a dollar to someone in another country. Like, good luck. <laughs> it's a pain. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's, that's what I see tokenizing the web mean. Like, I can just go, and that's what Steam does, right? I can read your blog wherever you live. It doesn't matter. And I can easily transfer you some money. Now, it may be transferring some of my own money, or what Steam adds is just an easy way to give some of the inflation, essentially, to you, so I don't have to spend my own money. Um, I mean, do you guys agree with that, and, and how do you see, like, I guess, as far as the challenge, like, how do you see getting that message across to other people and other sites so they want to participate? No, I mean, uh, that's another way of articulating it for sure. And uh, it's just that with the, anything can be a st store of value, you know, and in any transaction between people, whether it is in a, in a dollar for dollar, Bitcoin for Bitcoin, or in a favor for favor, anything that can be uh, digitalized as an asset, I think. Just making it more frictionless is the word that I like to say. Is because once you have that in place, then you can run things more efficiently. So now that's probably not something you need to Im educate people about necessarily. It's just, you know, you don't need to educate people about why something is better, just that it delivers something better at the end that they care about, that it's faster, that it's safer, whatever is other factors that the users care about. But no, I agree with you. Yeah. Well. I completely agree. It's, you know, the Internet of Value, you know, uh, linking value, and and sometimes it 
I, I, there was this experiment in BitShare called Brownie Points, wherever whenever someone uh, gave a favor to someone, uh, you could give away brownie points, and that became kind of like a little social currency where later on, let's say there was a airdrop being like, hey, people who, who've been helping out each other, here's some, some actual token with a monetary value for, uh, it's like a goodwill token, you know? That, and now how do you, how do you bring that to uh, mainstream? It, I was just uh, talking with my wife and she has this game she loves, it's interior design. So, you know, you play interior design, but in games, there, people know tokens. People know how to buy little diamonds and little hearts and, and money to spend on digital goods. Like people do it all the time. Now, how do you, uh, you know, like it, it's not like something so abstract that people don't understand. They understand in-game currencies that exist forever. Now, how do you, do you make it so that it's uh, as easy to use as within their game and then that actually as a, mon and they realize that there's a monetary value attached to it. Um, is kind of the challenge because then we have to deal with security, which is not something they, they have to deal with. But I think the idea of a token maybe is the, 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 the word itself that gets people like um, uh, puzzled because when they actually when in their life or in their mobile app, there's probably a lot of them. They just are not able to be transferred and uh, sold and bought uh, as, as, as decentralized way so yeah it, I'm still I'm still thinking about how how to not educate but how to get people to to, to use this internet um, in a way that's like flipping a switch yeah. and that's a great challenge like a sort of educate experience like you know just it, gaming is a really good entry point for that because yeah everyone is people are accustomed to you know, I'll use these golden crystals to redeem for this thing. And then it's just, it, it, kids are used to it. Uh, adults are used to it now. It's, we're in an app culture already of all of these different types of points. And they just don't yet have a marketplace where you can, you know, take your Candy Crush points from here and do this to that. <laughs> and it, like, I think that's what, it, it's, it is a natural progression. I think people do get too caught up in the terminology and trying to understand every little bit of something because it's an emerging technology that people raise questions for like that. But yep. a, you know, as soon as these, especially gaming is such a good entry point because of the way e-gaming has, that industry has exploded over the last you know, decade or so. And you know, the fact that I think kids are getting scholarships to school for you know, playing Fortnite and everything else, <laughs> I, think, I think that's an indicator for the blockchain industry as a whole that people are becoming more um, familiarized and more comfortable and more uh, aware of how games work and how we can gamify the web in a different way. So yeah, if we could find a way to, to make, turn content discovery and content creation like a game, right. um, I think that would really help people say, hey, come and join this, this game, this, 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 this game we play where we value each other's content on an, either on a monetary or non-monetary point system, right. uh, just like we do on mobile apps. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's an idea to throw out there. But yeah, I think like uh, Michael and I, who's uh, the co-founder of Sandbox, we were talking the other day about, you know, what if instead of Binance or instead of an exchange, what if there was just, you could log onto a game and as a guy, you're just like mining something and that's part of the transaction that has to take place. <laughs> you know, to trade with somebody, you have to go into this avatar and like communicate with somebody and digitally shake a hand or do something visual. I, I think we're gonna get close to that at some point where, you know, the whole kind of backdrop of uh, that's more technical becomes really compelling in an interaction and engageable sort of way. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, I have to cut you off there, although you closed in yourself, so I don't have to use force. Um, all right, uh, I'm really looking forward to next year because I think some of the thoughts that and questions we've been raising here will start to see the early examples of. And so I don't know about you guys, but I'm very excited yeah. about seeing more and more websites starting to use this in more and more ways. And I think what we need is just websites to try and fail on their own. Everyone has an opinion, you said UI, about how Steam its UI should be, but how can they make a change that everyone is happy with because everyone has to go by the same. When you have different websites, they can try different ways of displaying Steam and it making peop letting people interact with Steam that's tailored for their type of audiences. You know, not only can they tailor make it for them, it's like a, 
people can see what worked and what didn't work for different types of interfaces, and I think it's just good for innovation for uh, on Steam. So, no, oh, with that, with that really thank agree. you very much yeah. for uh, joining me here, thank and you. thank you all for being in the room or listening in, or yeah, Steam on. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you, Frederica, for hosting this session, man. Man, props. Cheers. See you at the drinks. Because we're going to have some uplifting drinks right after the final, last, but not least, presentation of Steam Fest 3. That's actually quite weird. It's already the last presentation is going to happen, right? It's, well, it's quite an honor, I guess, to be the last. I mean, who knows whether there will be another Steam Fest ever. Maybe you'll be the last speaker ever at Steamfest. Am I hinting at something? With the centralized <laughs> nature of it. Uh, that's true. Um. Good evening. So um, I'm Alex Grunsev, and uh, I've been uh, in the high-tech sector for like 20 years. Uh, applying different technologies, building uh, different products. And uh, there is uh, uh, an event in the life uh, when uh, basically the blockchain uh, disrupted a lot of things and a lot of understanding how things were done before. And uh, what amazed me uh, when you look back at how we've been building products and how we've been innovating. Much of it was based on uh, the economy of obscurity. So basically, if we build something, we don't want our competitor uh, to benefit from it. Uh, we want to build a barrier and not let them in as uh, too quick, right? If you have a customer, uh, how do you protect, right? So you don't want that customer to know anything about uh, other options that exist there. Uh, and then you go to these conferences, which are you know, well organized and everything, but the generally mood is very reserved. And uh, here, you know, spending the last couple of days here with all of you, you see that there is something entirely different here, right? Yeah, if you see somebody is developing something, you're actually super excited to talk to them. You want to share ideas. Uh, I don't remember many conferences where customers and vendors will actually mingle together happily. Like, uh, you know, you have content creators here, and suddenly, like, yeah, let's talk about how we can improve the product. Why? Well, because we both benefit. Uh, I talk to uh, anybody who can be potentially perceived as competition, and we're almost hugging each other. Why? Because if you succeed, I actually benefit from it too. And this is the nature of the open platform. This is something I believe uh, we will contemplate long yeah, years after the fact we'll start to understand what actually happened. Uh, because uh, just similar to like Linux changed the, the world of operating systems, especially on the level of servers and uh, um, high capacity computing and all of that. So we will see how this uh, changes the ecosystem of social networking. So um, let me jump in and try to... So being a Steamian uh, has uh, one unique thing. Um, probably you all have to be an expert in replying to the question where the money comes from. Like, you know. And uh, um, it's, uh, it's amazing to see different explanations. Like, typically, we just uh, resort to something very simple. Uh, you know, we say, okay, there is so, many, so much steam in existence, there is inflation. In fact, when you think about it, like, uh, with the market cap of uh, steam today, even at the bottom of the market, we're talking like 230 mil, uh, with the 9% inflation, 75% of reward pool. Anyway, you end up with $19 million, which will be paid today, this year by Steam for content creators, creators, and all of the community. That is a substantial portion. Like, yeah. Um, so the natural question comes next, like, oh, if everybody is being paid, 
we're taking the value out of the system, so uh, the system will end up with no v value in it left. Uh, and that's usually the question uh, where uh, it's uh, interesting to ask, but how the value appeared in the first place? Like nobody actually put like uh, it there, right? And the, uh, so how, uh, there must be a demand. There was no a single investor that just bought it all and then we all drain from their resources. Never happened. Okay, so what is that that uh, steam system actually exports? And uh, we explain it like, uh, you know, authors, creators, they need to have a balance, right? Uh, the other interesting thing is that bots, being all the annoying that they are at times, uh, we also know that they uh, offer actually return on investment in crypto that you can't find anywhere else. Uh, well, a little secret, but if you use some of the bots and delegate to them, you can get up to like 20% annual uh, returns on um, on that. Uh, also, we're expecting like SMTs to also increase demand so that apps have to freeze some of these assets and uh, also uh, increase the value of the system with all of uh, the innovation that will follow. But today, I actually want to um, take you on a different journey. And I want you to Im reimagine together with me advertising. Well, when you say the word advertising, what comes immediately to your mind? Well, somebody is going to harass me. You know, somebody is going to chase me on my, you know, uh, and uh, ruin my ad free experience uh, on the uh, Steam blockchain and all of that. Uh, but you can't really do advertising in this traditional form on a distributed chain. Well, if one app starts to bother me with user experience that is filled with advertising, what do I do? Switch to another app. So it's, uh, it, it doesn't work like that. So what we can do, and uh, the proposal that I would like to uh, address to you is attention trading. So basically, to allow business to put their bid for attention directly onto the blockchain, uh, which will state that I'm as a business, I would like to pay you something directly in exchange for, you know, I'll maybe you watch my video, for example, and I'll pay you $5. Something as simple as that. Uh, the action that will be uh, very clearly verifiable, uh, verified by the uh, like digital uh, or some other process. Okay, so for the business, um, the difficulty with buying attention directly today on the internet is that I really don't know who my customer is. You know, it's, it's always uh, like a, a game, but not on the blockchain. Uh, when I was talking to some businesses and said like, oh, we can advertise on the blockchain, uh, directly buy the attention, and they say like, yeah, but how many there are, and uh, how, like, what are the targeting opportunities and all of that. I go to Steam it and show, the, like, you can see literally how much money in the wallet of every customer. I said, no way. I said like, okay, let's go. Like, open home feed, click this guy, click this guy. I said like, no way. <laughs> like, we can actually target our message based on the actual capital that the person has? Yes, and responds to their posts. You can actually see who voted them. You can actually target all the people who upvoted that post. No way. Yes, that's what we already have today and is fully transparent. Uh, imagine um, the presentation for that kind of stuff. Uh, instead of, uh, you know, ads polluting, the user experience. They can now be all collected like in a separate tab in an app, which will tell you like, oh, there are like eight uh, requests for your attention pending. And you can open it and you can say like, okay, ignore that, never show anything from that source anymore. Uh, for this guy, well, counterbid it and say like, if he pays twice, I'll do that. And here I'll do something. And maybe I even have automatic settings saying that my attention uh, for that type of proposals is minimum like 100 bucks. Don't talk to me. But if there is maybe charitable or something, maybe I'll sell it for five cents or maybe it's just my hobby. Well, I won't pay to get it, but 
I'll get, uh, settle for something less. Well, the next question though comes is that uh, businesses need um, something more precise. Like, okay, we know uh, who you are and how engaging you are, but what is your topical interest? Are you interested in outdoor activities so that I can offer you my shoes, hiking shoes or something like that? Are you interested in maybe uh, wine and maybe you will be interested in, you know, some food recipes? What are you interested in? Are you interested in travel? How do I know that? And that's where the difficulty comes a little bit with the, with the Steam blockchain, is that much of the uh, analysis can be done on hashtags, but there are very few of them. Like we generally limit the, the tags, there are five of them. The other difficulty is, if I'm writing about a restaurant, uh, somebody else writing about the same thing, we will not be able to link to the same thing. And uh, that's basically the proposal that Wayview comes, it's a soft protocol uh, for apps, especially the apps that are uh, focused on particular topic to, uh, to basically adopt, is that uh, we can have references to objects. Um, there are more details uh, due to time limitation, we don't go how this is uh, done, it uh, can be designed. Um, but what happens later if that uh, the user references, let's say, like you can say hashtags, links, uh, or objects, object being a restaurant or in the, maybe an item on the menu or something like that. So then the interesting thing comes is that because the proof of brain consensus allows us to understand the uh, value of each post, now imagine we can actually uh, look into uh, these objects, into hashtags, into links, and see how much each, each one of them has value. Like basically all the pods that referenced, they had some earnings, we split them e uh, equally or in a certain proportion of the frequency uh, to these objects. And now, let's say it's a big city, like, I don't know, Rome, which is often referenced, uh, that has big value. Uh, smaller place, referenced not so often, we get, uh, less um, of the size of it. It's similar, like, you know, you're familiar with the tag page on the Stimit, right? We've got large tags and how much millions of dollars are behind uh, each, each of the major tags, right? But imagine we can go way deeper than that. Uh, and we can actually present the value of each uh, granular thing. So inside the object, uh, because we know who contributed to that value. We can actually have like sort of shares, uh, a person share in that object, which will uh, in the real world will be described as uh, expertise. Expertise of the person in that object. Like basically how knowledgeable that person is about Rome or how knowledgeable they are about this, you know, red wine or something like that. So now we actually don't just rely on one reputation rank for everything. We can actually be extremely precise. And uh, yeah, I'll uh, just basically. So now I can take all these objects and uh, assemble them into a subset. For example, I can take all the hiking uh, trails around uh, Krakow and uh, maybe cycling. Uh, tracks. And so what do I get? I, I can get the list of people uh, who are actually interested in outdoor activities. Okay, maybe we need to add camping, we need to add some other activities. And now I am as a business, I actually have a very precise tool as to address the audience on Steam as to whom I actually want to make uh, an offer. Um, a little bit about objects. Um, so objects themselves are also need to be community-based. They cannot be locked in uh, particular apps. They need to be very flexible. It's, uh, think about it of, as like wiki, uh, but where every parameter of the object can be voted. So for example, uh, I added a picture to a restaurant um, and somebody else did. Each of them is voted separately and this way we understand which picture will be used because the community voted for that. Uh, we, can uh, we can do it with anything. We can basically describe uh, you know, our uh, emotions about uh, taste uh, for the 
for the wine, for the beer, for any recipe and all of that. And we can accumulate that knowledge over time so that all the social posts which will appear later on the blockchain will actually con contribute to, to that object. So with uh, increasing the ability of businesses to target uh, users uh, by their interests, uh, we can also introduce, besides trading attention, we can actually offer uh, something in the future. So, for example, if uh, the, mm, the user will provide, um, uh, let's say, write a post or a review or something like that, uh, the business can also uh, upvote that post if they have sufficient funds uh, that they have in their account, or just basically also pay uh, just a small bonus for that. And it will be done in a very transparent way. Uh, so, like, basically people say, like, hey, here goes our ad-free environment. Uh, not really, because you are the beneficiary now. Just think about it. All of that opportunity now just lands in your hands. And... Uh, I believe that uh, now we can talk about adding dramatic value to this team ecosystem, and uh, which is basically bringing actual business into the system, uh, allowing attention and reference trading, uh, which will increase benefits to apps. Uh, apps obviously serving um, these offers will receive a percentage uh, from, from that as well. Uh, but again, like majority of the, va the value goes to the user. That's the fun foundation, and this is the principle of the open platform. So all the value will go to the user. Yes, there are some uh, players that will make it easier, uh, app, apps that will make a, a great interface, uh, great user experience, and uh, so they can benefit from that. And at some point, I hope that we can uh, see e-commerce. E so if we bring business, if we allow them to interact with the audience and not be some, you know, isolated, unknown kind of strange uh, set of people who, you know, keep their private keys uh, and know things about blockchain and being educated and being very strange. But reality is, if business comes in a major way onto the platform, uh, if they're um, allowed to basically be effectively communicating with us through the big uh, blockchain, distributed blockchain, we also would like to see the e-commerce allowed. Obviously today with uh, st uh, basically Steam requiring 13 weeks to, uh, for the power down, it's not a very in instant and intuitive experience uh, uh, to complete a business transaction. Uh, but uh, as we move forward with SMTs, uh, obviously we'll see a lot more experimentation here. So today I would like uh, to uh, announce a couple projects uh, that are trying to uh, implement uh, the Waveo protocol and uh, the attention trading. Uh, one is Invest Arena, and I have Konstantin here uh, in the room um, uh, from Ukraine uh, representing the team of uh, 15 developers that are uh, seriously building a very interesting product, uh, which is will be like, you know, the problem with, uh, let's say, ICOs and something like that is that uh, if you want to have a rating or understanding of it, uh, usually it will be like a four or five sta star rating from the website owner that lists that. And it's a not a very accurate way to actually understand what's going on. The idea is to have uh, forecasters, uh, experts, that will actually uh, record their forecast uh, on the blockchain. And once the event happens, we actually verify that, whether they were successful in their prediction or not. And then you calculate what's called Briar score. So you accumulate their success rate in prediction over time. So the next time they say something, uh, you know that uh, basically, are they, they good? And if they continue to be good, so th their predictions will be placed higher so that they can earn uh, better uh, uh, rewards for, for their work. And uh, on the extreme side of it, we actually want to build something extremely specific, like to a very particular niche, like uh, fishing, like sport fishing, and uh, allow uh, sport fishermen to enjoy uh, basically, well, 
if some of you were to that sport, you understand how important it is to understand what's happening, where it's happening, and what needs to be used, and what do you need to bring with you. And uh, this can only be accumulated from a large uh, subset of data uh, for all the previous uh, people that uh, did the same thing. And then you accumulate that. And the same experience applies to a lot of niches, which today will be very difficult to implement on Steam blockchain. Like, for example, if you want to build an app for uh, skateboard uh, enthusiasts, um, they need uh, a lot of details, right? They need to know where the tracks are. Uh, can, uh, are there any particular streets that are good for skating? Um, what kind of equipment do you use? Uh, how do you do tricks? Uh, have you actually proved that you can do this trick or that trick? Uh, you see all these details. So I believe that uh, we can see a dramatic increase in interest uh, on the Steam blockchain once we can build projects which will be uh, oriented to a particular very specific audience. And um, uh, essentially that would allow us to have a very detailed understanding for targeting and allow businesses to sell, uh, sorry, to buy attention of the audience directly on the blockchain. So these are the thoughts, um, and uh, now we can enjoy, well, if there are questions, uh, we'll be happy to address, but uh, for the most part, I understand we're now heading to have some drinks, and uh, we'll be happy to answer questions. Please come join, and uh, we'll be happy to interact. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Grandpa. Thanks a lot, Grandpa. <coughs> and ladies and gentlemen, with that, the official plenary part of uh, Steamfest 2018 has already come to an end. I think we've seen 50 presentations, or I, I've, I haven't seen any presentation, but <laughs> I hope you guys saw some of the presentations. I'm actually going to watch them all at home because we've been recording them, and I'm now looking at you, Mr or misses watching live, or maybe I'm now talking to myself when I'm watching this Well, after a couple of weeks, right? You see where I'm getting at. Um, I want to thank all the speakers for uh, well being on the stage. I want to thank you for being so attentive and coming here. And uh, I will. it's not the end of the event, right? It's just the end for the live stream watchers. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, kids, grown-ups, Thanks a lot for watching this year's uh, live stream. I hope the quality was okay. Um, maybe I recommend you to next year actually come here wherever it may be because it's so much more fun. Right, guys? <laughs> so there you have it. I hope this audio comes through. Uh, see you next year. And uh, for now, enjoy the weekend. We're going to do that because it's still two and a half days before we leave Krakow. Bye-bye. <coughs> Okay, so and then uh, we do...